गुड मॉर्निंग जी सर गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल यू टू टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम वी विल स्टार्ट आफ्टर टेन फिफ्टीन ए एम
Uh, good morning, sir. I am audible, sir. Yes, audible. Good morning, sir. Hello. Good morning, Das sir. Sir, I am audible. Hey, yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, Doctor, uh, good morning, sir. Doctor, is there, sir? Yes, yes. Good morning, uh, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Sir, can you share that your slide so that we can see just uh, have a look, now? Yes, yes, yes. I am waiting. May I share? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Please, sir. Please. So, the just go to the go to the green button, which is uh, arrow markup, na? Huh? Share. शेयर कॉन्टेक्ट करके एक सेंड शेयर कॉन्टेक्ट नीचे है ना ये सर व्हेन यू क्लिक द टेक हां शेयर स्क्रीन हां वो स्कैश शेयर स्क्रीन यू जस्ट क्लिक मैं यहां दैट यू जस्ट ऑन दैट योर पीपीटी सर इन योर कंप्यूटर पीडीएफ मतलब पीपीटी ओपन ऑलरेडी यू पीपीटी यू शुड ओपन इन दैट सिस्टम देन यू कैन शेयर दैट योर पीपीटी इन दैट ज़ूम इट मी PPT has been opened. Opened. Then you just share that thing. Now you go to Google uh, Zoom Meet. Oh, Zoom Meet. Uh, green, green color arrow is there, na, sir. No, green. Mute. Start video. The next one is the arrow button is there, na? Up arrow. Okay. Share. <laughs> ah, ah. Now you just maximize that your PPT, sir. Yeah, five card is here. Now it is coming. Ah. Screen. Yeah, now screen is coming. Screen is coming. Then, but you have to just. Ah, uh, it's okay, sir. Now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Audible. Voice is also clear. Audible. Yeah, voice is also clear, sir. Very good. Very good. I was wondering. Yeah. Good morning, sir. I am audible, sir. Yes. Yes. Pardon. Yes, sir. You can uh, go forward with your uh, presentation, sir. Nothing, no, no. It's up, sir. Now, sir. Huh. Time two thirty. No, sir. Actually, as per the program schedule, I think uh, one more presentation is there. Hmm. 
Rawat sir, shall I start the program? Yes, yeah, Madam, you start. Yeah. First lecture is of Konadas, sir. Excuse me. Yes. Yes, myself, uh, myself, Doctor Konadas. You know that uh, as per the schedule, I have my presentation first. Yes, I think. Okay. Uh, then uh, you can just uh, dis uh, that uh, shut down that your presentation, sir. Close okay. that. Uh, you will leave that presentation. Yeah. Oh. Uh, side, sir. Uh, side. Stop. Stop share. Ah, uh, stop share. Yeah. Good morning, Kanagada, sir. Yes, good morning. How are you, sir? Yes. Waiting, waiting for your lecture, sir. Okay. A very good morning to all. And very sorry for, like, uh, due to technical problem, we start very late. So, uh, warm welcome to uh, second day of today's capacity building training program on plant taxonomy systematics and phytodiversity organized by ap science center uh, arunachal pradesh state council for science and technology department of uh, science and technology government of arunachal pradesh in collaboration with botanical survey of india arunachal pradesh regional center itanagar i on behalf of organizing committee would like to uh, welcome all the esteemed speakers, uh, Dr. Karan Das, uh, Dr. B. S. Kolia, Dr. M. U. Sera, Professor B. Urudaya Raj, Kalyam Koti, and Dr. R. K. Gupta. And also I take a privilege to welcome all the participants who have joined with us uh, to online and offline mode. Uh, once again, warm welcome to all. Okay, so with this, we begin our program. Uh, I would like to invite. I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Dr. Kananda, scientist E. He will be talk on. Uh, Diversity and systematic uh, systematic of wild mushroom. Before I uh, invite our first speaker, I would like to call upon Dr. Rawat to kindly give a detailed uh, introduction of our first speaker. Rawat, sir. Good morning, Kanada, sir. Why is Dr. Vinit, you have uh, you have you are having one more uh, connection to your mobile connection. You please switch up your mouse mobile mobile connection so that it will not reflect. Na? Repeat the sound. After working on the taxonomic study of wild Himalayan mushrooms, Dr. Kanatas was awarded as Doctor of Philosophy by Hemati Nandan Bahugana Gadwan University, India in 2005. Presently, he is working at the capacity of scientist Joint Director Level in the Cryptogamic Unit of Central National Herbarium, Botanical Survey of India, Havda. His research interest is uncovering the diversity of wild mushrooms through uh, morphotaxonomy and molecular uh, phylogeny. Till date, Dr. Das has surveyed uh, vast regions of Himalaya from west to east in India and few forests of west Slovakia and a small part of Rocky Mountains, USA. He has discovered, established two new genera, 130 new species, new to science of wild mushrooms for the Indian mycobiota till date. He himself jointly with his co-workers has published four books, 130 research papers, and six edited book chapters. He had delivered many invited talks in India and abroad, being invited by the government of Andalusia. He represented the nation 
and delivered his presentation in the opening session of the first world conference on the conservation and sustainable use of wild fungi in uh, cordoba spain in 2007 a couple of students are awarded with phd after pursuing research work under his supervision he is the member of some learned society in december 2015 he was awarded with bharat jyoti for his meritorious service on science by india international friendship society thank you sir now it is requested to start your presentation sir may i start now मैडम मैडम यू 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 आर 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 नॉट नॉट ऑडिबल यस सर 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 कैन कैन टेक टाइम ओके ओके आई आई स्टार्ट यस Is it visible? Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is coming now. Your voice is also clear. Now you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, respected uh, Director, Botanical Survey of India, distinguished uh, delegates from all over the nation, eminent scientists, my fellow colleagues, and my dear students, who are the future scientists i believe ladies and gentlemen good morning to all of you i am a student of uh, mushroom taxonomy and my today's talk is diversity and systematics of wild mushrooms let us first uh, just for the convenience of the student let us first see what is actually one or side dusre kisi dusri jagah pahunch gaye yaar hello is it clear hello yes 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 it is clear sir it is clear you can just go ahead okay uh, for the convenience of the student uh, let us first discuss what is uh, taxonomy in a nutshell you know it is our natural instinct that we desire to sort out things into groups you remember those days when we used to collect coins when we used to collect stamps and we usually categorize them into groups based on the country based on the year etc and so on and grouping things together on the basis of features they have in common is called as classification and what is taxonomy then the science of classification is called as taxonomy which have two functional areas one nomenclature naming of organism and systematic placing of organisms into groups my today's talk is focused on morphologically diverse world of wild mushrooms key morpho taxonomical parameter used in macro and micro morphological identification limitation of morphological studies resolving taxonomic issues with molecular phylogenetic inferences let us first see what are um, a mushrooms you know that um, mushrooms are nothing but you know hello uh, yes uh, you know that um, a, a mushroom are actually those fungi which are Uh, 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 the fruit body of which are visible through naked eyes, and that represent a small part in the kingdom fungi. Now, what is fungi? What is the uh, what is about the uh, kingdom fungi? You know, they represent a monophyletic clade being sister to animal kingdom. You can see this is the uh, clade of fungi. They are. they are sister to animal kingdom not plant kingdom right so they are heterotrophic organism mostly hyphal they are with 
parasitic, saprophytic, and symbiotic mode of reproduction or nutrition, spore bearing, achlorophyllous, cell wall normally of chitin, and their mode of reproduction, sexual and asexual. And you know that mushrooms, so what are the mushrooms? You can see that these are two advanced phyla among the kingdom fungi, the Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. And mushrooms belong to these two advanced phyla, uh, phyla. and russulales, agaricales, boletales, chantrails, polyporales, tremelales, et cetera, helicales, pizizales, xylerales, et cetera, are the major orders of mushrooms. Now let us see that how, uh, what is the number of uh, fungi. You know, in 1943, when the first edition of the Dictionary of Fungi came, it came with 38,000 species. And in 2008, when the 10th edition came, it came with 98,000 species. And again, uh, very recently in 2018, when Wills 2018 was published, it was published with 1,44,000 species. So the number of species in fungi increased by 60,000 in 65 years. Again, the number of species in fungi increases by 46,000 in recent 10 years. So you can say that the rate of discovery per year around the world is about 4,600 species. So present day estimation is that the kingdom fungi, which appears to be the second most species kingdom in the earth. And, and the estimation is about 2.8 to 3.2 million fungi. And you know, the reported number of species around the world is approximately 1,50,000 species. So where we are, we approximately only 5% microbiota is known today and rest are still unknown. Now see why the number is so high. You know that the, why the estimation is so high because the increasing the rate of discovery of fungi per year, finding several unexplored sources, like crypto, crypto endolithic communities, that is immersed rock in Antarctica, and soil fungi, diversity awaited, environmental DNA, the estimation goes high and high. We do not know when it will come to an end. So that is why the uh, estimation is so high. And you know, since last 23 years, I am struggling hard to know only 1% to 2% of this fungi well. Based on my experience since last 23 years on especially on Himalayan mushrooms, we have major morphology based 16 groups. Let us see this enormous diversity. You know, first, the gild mushroom, or if I, you can say agar-required mushrooms, they are very much common. Sometimes you can find in the market even, and we collect uh, for, uh, and we consume as food. And you know, the, see the enormous diversity of the fertile area. See, this is the fertile surface. And here we have gilds, right? This is Amanita phalloides. This is my collection from Slovakia. And you know that this is the most poisonous mushroom in the world. Similarly, you have Tricholomopsis, you have Lucula, Luteotecta, all are gild mushroom. Coming to the next, uh, just, just to give you an idea about the size, you can see on my left, my, my friend Pablo, uh, a Spanish friend Pablo, he uh, he was uh, five years back. He was coming back from Brazil with this huge mushroom, Macrocybe titans. And on my right, you can see um, a lady of uh, Central Asia. Uh, she is carrying this gigantic uh, a mushroom, Termitomyces titanicus. And you 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 will be you will you will be surprised to know that this mushroom may be one to one and a half meter in diameter, and they are highly edible. Coming to the second group, 
Earlier, we have seen that the fertile surface is gilled. Now we can see that the fertile surface is with tubes that ends with pores. So they are called as bolets. You can see the, uh, this is a species of Suillus. This is Suillus laricifilus. This is Tylopilus, etc., and so on. Again, I have to see you the. I have to show you the sizes. You know, uh, I am carrying to uh, Rugi boletus, boletoid mushroom, uh, in Shikim, and one of my one of my oldest friend, uh, Dr. Hari Vat, who used to accompany me in the field. Uh, in in uh, 2005 to seven, he uh, he was uh, carrying uh, the cap of a boletoid mushroom. So you can imagine how big they may be. Similarly, they are club club fungi. They are bracket woody poroid fungi like boletoid mushroom. They have also the uh, the tubes. They have also the tubes and ended with pores. You can see the pores here on my right side. And they are called as bracket mushroom. So just, uh, just see, we are just, uh, uh, just recapitulate that we are observing the enormous diversity of the mushroom, especially the fertile areas. You can see we have, we have seen gilled mushroom, we have seen poroid mushroom. Now they are pseudo gilled mushroom. You know, here the surface is wrinkled or veined or you can say they are not, but they are not actually, they are not gills, but they are gill, they, they give an appearance of gill like structure. That is why they are called as pseudo gills. Sometimes the surface may be smooth even. So they are, they are uh, highly appreciated all over the world and they are uh, uh, highly edible as well. And, you know, they are chanterelles and trumpets. Then coming to the next group, here you can see the fertile areas, nothing but the spines, right? See the diversity. We have seen gills, we have seen pseudo gills, we have seen pores. Now we are seeing spines as a fertile area. See, this is a, a mushroom, uh, Herisium yunthangens. It was discovered by me in 2013 from Shikin. The, uh, here you can see the spines. Again, coming to the another group that is stomach fungi. My pop balls are asters. You know, here, here uh, the spores they they uh, mature inside this closed stomach-like uh, stomach-like structure, and after the maturity, the pore develop, and the spores are dispersed. Right. So these uh, mushrooms are uh, uh, instead of instead of um, Gymnocarpic, they are called as angiocarpic because they are covered. Spores remain inside the covering. So they are stomach mushroom. You can see this is uh, lycopardon, this is geostrum, uh, this is mitromyces, this is scleroderma, etc. Similarly, they are uh, uh, this is coral mushrooms. This is uh, you can see bird nest fungi. You, you can see the peridioles are so nicely uh, uh, placed inside the peridium. The entire structure gives the appearance of a nest of a bird carrying eggs. That is why they are called as bird's nest fungi. Here is a new species, Nidula singbensis, uh, discovered by us in 2014. They are uh, jelly fungi. You can see the texture, the jelly like. They, they, they are the species of tremella. They are sting horns. See the diversity, how diverse the mushrooms, mushroom, uh, mushroom morphologically are. See, they are sting horns. You know, you know that the during and the maturity of the spore mass, spore mass, they produce foul smell. And that is why, you know, that the, from a distant place, with the help of the smell or odor, we can recognize, yes, here is my, here, I think in, in a near, near, uh, by nearby place, I can found a uh, sting horns or phallus. They are the species of phallus, mutinous, etc. Here at the calf fungi, or swasher fungi, you can say, they, this is Pizaiza, this is Scutellinia scutellata, this is uh, uh, Chlorosiboria, etc. 
We discovered another calf fungi, Urnula, Urnula Himalayana in 2018. See another group, they, it is very interesting. They are called as tongue fungi or earth tongues. They are geoglossum or trichoglossum, or uh, the, you can find also jelly babies. They are Leotia lubrica and Leotia viscosa. Another groups they are called as saddles. You know what is saddles? Saddles are nothing but the seat on the back of a horse. So their cap resembles with the saddle. That is why they are called as saddles. They are the species of Helvella or Gaidomitra. Often they are found to be poisonous. Another group, carbon or cushion fungi. You can see they are stone hard, stone hard species. And uh, they mainly they grow mainly they grow on a dead decaying tree trunk. And you know that other other groups of mushrooms I put in two groups mainly. And uh, here you can see that you can see there are four groups. One is spatula shape spatularia. One is uh, pseudohydnum. One is one sided open cup that is Oetidia, and, uh, and the last one is More, that is Morcella. And here is the last slide for the diversity. You know, this is uh, shaving brush fungi. You can see the, you can see the morphology. They looks like shaving brush. And that is why they are called as shaving brush fungi, uh, tri uh, Trichocoma paradoxa. They, they are cauliflower fungi, Sparasis. They are uh, ear fungi, auricularia. This is corticoid fungi, pineophora incarnata. Now see, uh, now let us know uh, wh what, are, uh, what are the duties of a mushroom hunter? What, what we usually do uh, for successful mushroom hunting? We do, and we do undertake thorough intense, intensive and extensive exploration. We, do, we, we used to take good photography of habit and habitat. We collect young to mature fruiting bodies. We uh, do undertake characterization. This is the most important part. You know that uh, if you do not take this part that is characterization, it is next to impossible for you to identify any species of wild mushroom, right? So we take uh, we uh, spend a lot of time to characterize our mushrooms in the field. We do macromorphological characterization. And coming back in the laboratory, we undertake micromorphological characterization. And then we concert literature for the identification. And then we put them in a um, proper systematic placement. And finally, we uh, document our uh, document our species with the description, illustration, and drawings and our notes. So this is the process. Now coming to the macromorphological survey, you know that when sometimes alone, sometimes with my colleague, sometimes becoming a part of a team, survey team, we used to take uh, uh, survey tours to different part of uh, India especially the forested areas. You can see that uh, our, uh, UK, uh, our team crosses the last village of India, that is Mana village and approaching towards Bodrinath. And here in the right hand side, you can see that um, uh, 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 our, camp is, our camp is almost packed and we are uh, trying to approach to the next forest. And see, we are approaching, our team is approaching to uh, Indochina border, Chia Vanjang. Uh, we are crossing here, we are crossing a um, pinus forest. You know, sometimes even uh, we may have food, we may have or may not have food, we may have uh, water or may not have sufficient water. But you know that I, one thing I, I can assure you that you know that uh, you will you will forget all your pain and agony once you discover a novel species or you we uh, or you come across an an interesting species so you know that uh, our team is uh, uh, in uh, uh, Dafia Dura Forest. You can find me. I am working on uh, working with the mushrooms. And uh, uh, here, uh, our team has Soka. 
Uh, this is my camp. This is in 2017. We, uh, uh, our team is there inside this tent, and uh, it is. Um, we were serving uh, Majaratal. These are the thing what I uh, used to carry uh, with me uh, during my field survey, and. Uh, I have already told that the characterization is the most important part. So after collecting the species from the field, we uh, usually characterize, see I am, uh, uh, whatever maybe we used to character uh, by sitting on the baranda or storeroom or even inside the forest, inside my camp. So these are the thing, but you know that um, in the daylight, our duty is in the daylight, we have to finish our macromorphological characterization because you know that the pigmentation in mushroom is very very important also and if uh, so if you if you do not take the help of the proper light then maybe uh, you were going to describe your species wrongly and in turn you were uh, going to mislead the uh, mislead the, uh, the workers all over the world See, uh, this is the uh, this is the format. This is the format. What 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 we usually carry in the field. Here we have to record the uh, record the uh, habit notes, habitat notes. See, uh, we have to we have to record the different feature of the cap or pileus, diameter, color, consistency. Similarly, cuticle. Similarly, marginal characters, color, etc. We have to note down the different features of the gills for the guild mushroom. Similarly, we have to note down uh, the uh, characters of the context or flesh. Even we have to uh, note down the color or, or we have to take the taste of latex. Sometimes we have to note down the odor and uh, color of the spore print is also very, very important. See, uh, in this way, we have, we have to uh, put I put uh, 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 the, our mushroom, our mushroom cap to get the spore print in the next morning. And you know, the spore print often give us uh, valuable information to identify the species at least up to generic level. See, I have already told the latex are also very much important. In the field, we can see, suppose this is, uh, uh, this mushroom is having orange latex. This is having transparent latex. It is the case of Lactarius indoacuvasus. And this is the case of Vesterholti here, the latex. Uh, initially, they are white. They are, they, they turns, uh, they turns orange uh, when oxidized or when exposed. In case of this, uh, see, this is uh, Lactarius indochrysoreus. Here, the latex is yellow. And the, here is also Lactarius flabigalactus with yellow, lact yellow Lactaria. So these Lactarius often gives us some good information. And similarly, you know that we have to uh, re record different characteristic features of the cap, maybe with scales, maybe with hairs, different, different patterns of hairs are there, maybe pubescent, maybe tomentos, maybe velos, et cetera, and so on. Similarly, you know that the pileus or cap margin is very important and they may be enrolled in carb, maybe decarb, maybe eroded or, or interrupted. You can see the interrupted margin, maybe with appendages. See the attachment of gills. See the attachment of gills are quite important. Maybe the gills are free or maybe the gills are narrowly attached. That is adnext, maybe sinuate or nost, maybe adnet that is broadly attached gills, or maybe decurrent that is mm, going down the style. See the uh, distances between the gills are also very, very important. Maybe they are, maybe they are distant in some species like, uh, like uh, Lactiflas ocrogalactus. Maybe they are, maybe they are subdistant, maybe very, very crowded like Lactiflas piperatus. See the shape of the uh, shape of the stipe or stem is very, very important. Maybe they are mm, cylindrical, maybe clavate, maybe uh, bulbous, etc. and so on. I have already told that the spore print are very 
very much informative for us. You know that uh, if we get Eulospore print, if we get if, if, if we get Eulospore print, then maybe the um, uh, our mushroom belongs to genus Rusula or Lactarius. If maybe if we have rust colored spore print, maybe our species is uh, uh, under genus Cortinarius. If it is purple brown, maybe it is Agaricus, etc. And so on. You know that we used to, by sitting inside the tent or inside by in the forest, even from the fresh sample, we used to draw this macro, uh, we used to draw to show the macro morphological habit. And uh, 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 this is my drawing on different groups of uh, Rusula and Lactarius. And you can see this is also my drawing to show the attachment of gills in the field itself. You know, when the characterization, field characterization is over, we used to go for drying our sample. This is the field dryer. We keep our sample uh, overnight to uh, get our sample dry uh, uh, in the next morning. Uh, and we pack uh, our samples so that we can get our samples back dry samples back in the laboratory and we can start with micromorphological characterization with the help of microscope. Now coming to the micromorphological characterization, you know, uh, after coming back in the laboratory, we take hundreds of sections to see several morphological, micromorphological feature. See, uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the arrangement of the hyphae. This is very important. Maybe hyphae, hyphae are interwoven, maybe uh, divergent, maybe divergent or convergent. We uh, sometimes we have, you know, this is the fertile layer. And sometimes, you know, the fertile layer may, may mainly contains of basidia. And apart from basidia, we may have some uh, sterile structure. They are called a cysteria. And these cysteria are the character, are very much characteristics uh, for us. We, the taxonomists, I am telling again and again that we, the taxonomists, we are always in search of parameters. More the parameters we have, more easy for us to identify the species. That is why we have to characterize thorough, as thorough as possible. Uh, so, you know, uh, that is why we have to note down different types of cystidia and where they are placed and what are their features. See, I was working on a uh, different groove and you know that I got these many types of cystidia. See, there are with appendages. See, there are sometimes very thick wall. They are, uh, see, they, they are sometimes often clavet to subclavet or fusoid, etc., and so on. And, and these are my drawing on spore ornamentation. You can see the spores maybe with zebroid pattern and uh, maybe with a winged pattern maybe with, with complete reticulation, maybe complete reticulation, et cetera, and so on. Again, we have drawn recently uh, while working on uh, Rusulels of Shikim, you know that I, uh, I found these many patterns of ornamentation of basidiospores. See how characteristics, how characteristic they are. Maybe they are with zebroid pattern. These are, these are my drawing with camera lucida, and they may be winged, they may be spinoid, they may be completely reticulate, et cetera, and so on. So once we have macro and micromorphological characteristics in our hand, we used to prepare this kind of plates for a single species of mushroom, right? And finally, we uh, present our uh, documentation uh, to the ministry. Now coming to the pigmentation, you know that uh, mushroom inspired the cuisine in many cultures. And you know that mushrooms are uh, used in folk medicine also, but it is little known that they were earlier used as textile dyes as they have vast range of colors and pigments. And you know that they don't have chlorophylls, they don't have anthocyanin like plants, like green plants, but they have carotenoids, they have terpenoids, they have quinones, they have sesquiterpenoids, spalvinic acid, et cetera, and so on. And they give the wide range of pigmentation in different groups of mushroom. 
you know that the, this color or the, this pigment, they, this uh, changes, they, this color changes with maturity, some changes with bruising. If you touch, the color will change or some with, uh, some with uh, exposure because uh, with the help of oxygen, they are oxidized and, and different compounds are produced with different colors. Sometimes these parameters are very specific and used as key features for identification. You can see this is boletoid mushroom and, I, and you can find my, in the impression of my finger, I touched the, the pore surface was yellow. I touched that area I, and it turns, it turns blue. Right, because they have zero comic or variegated acid, and they uh, when they are exposed, the oxidization uh, takes place. Oxidation takes place, and you know that uh, the variegated acid turns to blue chinon method anions, corresponding blue chinon method anions. You can see uh, here is another mushroom that is Lactarius sub indigo. Here you can see that the entire um, species is blue with blue coloration, and the latex is indigo blue because they have the sesquiterpenoid blue lactarazulin. Similarly, we have the, one of the most beautiful mushroom, uh, Amanita muscaria. And, and they have wide range of pigmentations. We have uh, agaricus, xanthodermas. You know that the mushroom is white, but if we touch it, then it will turn uh, yellow because of its agaricone, presence of agaricone, which is a leucophenol. Would you believe that, but you know that this pigmentation is not all, but sometimes this pigmentation misleads us very much in identification, you know, could you believe that all these species are same, having different pigmentation? Could you also believe that they, all these species are different with similar pigmentation? Yes. So that is why thorough macromorphological characterization, micromorphological characterization is very much needed Along with, now we require one more thing. You know that amongst the species in several genera, there are large number of overlapping characters. You know, often the delimitation of species are mainly based, mainly, uh, uh, mainly based on the, you know, that uh, uh, microscopical character, cell to cell, cell level observation, which is a tedious job. And you know, so many genera have cryptic species or species complex or similar looking species. So, so if you have similar looking species, how can you identify them? Their morphology is same, their micromorphology is same. So how you can identify? And you know, intercontinental look alikes are also very much common in case of mushroom. And you know, earlier days, our Indian species, they are known after they are European or American localites. So checking of con specificity is a major concern for our mycologists today. So many we started, so what we did, that is why we started isolating the genes, barcoding regions. And you know, though, uh, we got the sequence and we try to get the phylogenetic relationship that is uh, to elucidate the relationship of uh, our species with our uh, with ancestral species or the allied species with the help of molecular phylogeny so many traditionally used uh, phenotypic characters in fungi we found that do not necessarily predict phylogenetic relatedness right and multiple morphology based species be our same DNA. So what we have to do? Then multiple cryptic species are called under same name. Means similar looking species, they are called under the same name all over the world, right? So sequestered members of the genus are treated under different name. So to find out the correct key characters, a delimiting factors is another issue. 
but this is true that the result of one or two gene may vary from current gold standard that is concordance of multi gene genealogies so nowadays what we do we we take combined analysis of morphology and molecular phylogeny to identify a species see field observation is required then thorough morphology is required then we consult literature we go for molecular phylogeny and then we finally identify our species see uh, we have discovered several species with the uh, with with this pattern with the help of this combined study see you can uh, see this is uh, rusula kujingensis and uh, you know that we have around 500 species uh, uh, that have red colored red colored fruiting bodies but how can you identify them sometimes even you know that a morphology a morphology is very much similar so that is why we go with molecular phylogeny and we found finally that we have some we have some typical micromorphological characters as well as we have a distinct place in molecular phylogeny and we published our species similarly we established um, Astrobolitus olivaceo glutinosus in Q bulletin in 2015, you know, uh, with the help of uh, this combined uh, strategy. Uh, see, Louis, uh, you know, that they, there is a group of mushrooms, they are called as swillers, and you know, they mainly grow under a coniferous tree, but there is a group that grow only under larix, larix, you know, under the tree, under the coniferous tree larix, right? So, in Shikim, we found this species under larix, and you know that we construct that phylo and we construct the phylogeny, and we found that the, all the larix loving species, all the larix loving species, they are clustered together. However, our species is recovered as a uh, our species is recovered as a distinct one, and that is why we published this one. And similarly, we published zero commas dutcha. Uh, with the help of our uh, circular phylogeny. Similarly, you know that uh, we uh, discovered the first Asian species of archaea with the help of uh, uh, morphology and phylogeny. You know that we uncovered the uh, hidden truth by uh, resolving the cryptic species that is species complex. You know that earlier there was a, a orange brown species called uh, Lactiflas volumus, and they was first reported from Europe. And gradually, you know that similar looking species uh, were found by se several scientists from different parts of the world, and they started calling them Lactiflas volumus as well. So that name Lactiflas volumus was misapplied all over the world for the similar looking species. From India also, we got uh, four species. One is Lactarius desitas, Leptomeras, Varsiformis, and Minamensis. Earlier, we used to call them as Lactiflas volumus, but you know that even the spore ornamentation, spore ornamentation are similar. And then we go for macro and micromorphology. We found they, uh, it is also very much similar. So how can we identify? Then we go for uh, uh, Peleus. Uh, we took Peleus section of cap, and we found that uh, only it is only in case of uh, Lactiflas varsiformis. Uh, you know that the hairs are long. In but in other two cases, the hairs are short. So differences very difference are very little. So that is why we took uh, multi gene phylogeny, and finally we found. And that our species are three different species, three different Asian species. One is Varsiformis, one is Leptomeras, and Dicitas. And again, another species from, uh, was very recently discovered as Lactiflas uh, minamensis. And with our phylogeny only, it is now revealed that we, in the entire world, we, uh, this is Lactiflas volumus is actually a cryptic species. Now it has 20 different species from the world. and you know, from India, we have four different species. Similarly, we we discovered first Asian species of uh, Gyroporus. We uh, discovered Lactiflas Indochrysorius, which was very much similar like European species Lactarius chrysorius. 
see this is the drawing of european species and this is my drawing from uh, indian indian species the difference is that you know in case of pileus from Euro european species they don't have gluten but here we have thick gluten on the pileus there is another twist you know that you know that uh, there was a species called uh, rusula compacta which was discovered 112 years ago from uh, from america and they were orange brown in color and if you touch the species it will turn brown see uh, uh, and you know that in india we found two of the two of the species which are very similar with uh, rusula compacta that is american one and we earlier we used to call them rusula compacta one uh, one i got from uh, coniferous trees uh, one I got from uh, with the association of coniferous trees and one with the association of uh, broadleaf trees. And you know, uh, uh, once we thought that the, whether these two species are similar or they both are Rusula compacta, that is uh, American one or not. So if to, to do this, to reveal that, we took a molecular phylogeny, but, but there, was, there was a difference. There was a small difference between these two Indian species that they have Forcation of gills. See the forcation with the red arrow marked with red arrow. Forcation of gills. And here, you know, the, the species which found under coniferous tree, and here we do not have forcation, but we have short gills. Instead of forcation, we have short gills. So this is the only delimiting features. So we have several questions. We took molecular phylogeny, and finally we found that see, this is the Rusula compacta clad, and this is the American species, and here these two red one is two two different indian species one grows under coniferous forest and one grows under broadleaf trees so similarly we discovered were the first sequestered mushroom sequestered lactarias from india You know that morphological characteristics, morphological characterization, for me, morphological characterization was indispensable earlier. Without proper characterization, it was not even possible to know any species and place it to a proper taxonomic position, right? Or to reveal conspecificity or to discover a novel species. And morphological characterization is still very important because you know that your poor or wrong characterization on a species will uh, you know that will uh, will mislead scientific community because someone else who are working on morpho who are working on molecular phylogeny they uh, they make they may catch you red handed that your taxonomy is not sufficient and are you wrongly characterized or not right so for me sequence from any biological material uh, is meaningless until and unless you know its phenotypic appearance. 2017 was the memorable year for us. You know, where we our discovery of number of novel Himalayan species passed 100. We discovered two new genera. Now we discovered two new genera and 100, 131 new species that are new to science. And this all these 131 species are distributed, are published in different world renowned journals. You can find me that I was uh, uh, representing nation in the first world conference of wild mushroom in Spain in 2007. And you know that we, the field mycologist, we uh, in every two years, we gather in several countries uh, to, uh, to uh, survey to study in that areas and uh, it was you know in uh, recently we all the field mycologists from all over the world we gathered in Adil Dravia and we uh, surveyed nine forests of Slovakia till date you know that more than 75 uh, forest was uh, surveyed by me uh, from uh, Botanical Survey of India and apart from uh, Indian forest. And apart from that, I have uh, taken survey uh, to uh, West Slovakia and uh, small part of Rocky Mountains, USA. 
I believe that the, uh, you know, that more and more mushroom taxonomies are required. And this is the high time when we have to survey the remaining part of this country. And uh, you know that uh, you, the students, who are the future uh, future scientists? I believe I uh, I I strongly hope that you will be able to uh, you will be able to survey those areas and uncover our uh, mushroom wealth. And these are few books that were uh, published by me and my colleagues, which may help you. Finally, you know that uh, I am grateful to Director Botanical Survey of India and the organizers and to my teachers and colleagues uh, in India and abroad. I am also thankful to my students and associates who are placed in different institutes. Thank you once again for your gracious presence and patience. And patience. Thank you very much. Hello. 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 Am I audible, sir? Hey, yes, yes, yes. Please. Hmm. Are you, are you are audible. Hello. Hello, please. You are audible. Yes, sir. It was very nice and informative lecture. You have emphasized on basics of wild mushrooms, which you have collected from different parts of the country. And really, I hope all the online and offline participants have enjoyed and they will learn more about the wild mushrooms. And I would like to discuss here to the all candidates that all the mushrooms are not useful. Uh, most of the mushrooms are poisonous. So uh, while you are uh, going to collect these mushrooms, so you have to be careful. Okay, sir, uh, I would like to ask one question. How many species are occurs uh, in India, sir, wild mushrooms? You know, uh, uh, today, we have around we have around three thousand species in different parts of India, and out of which and out of which you know uh, only one percent is poisonous. One per one percent is poisonous, and four percent are highly edible, and you know the rest are not worth taking. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much once again. Any question from participants? You may ask now. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, I am audible. Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice uh, lecture. I am from Jharkhand, Dr. S.L. Bondia. Sir, uh, there are any report uh, from Jharkhand? How many mushrooms are reported from Jharkhand, sir? You know, uh, it is a very good question. On Actually, uh, uh, one of my student, one of my student, Dr. Oniket Ghosh, uh, he, yes, he has taken the uh, survey and he has taken he is actually doing at present the survey and documentation of the mushrooms of jharkhand and okay. uh, and recently you know that he has uh, he has got around uh, 60 to 70 species good so he is he is act, he is actively working and i think by another two years his report will come okay sir okay okay, okay sir thank sir. you Another, sir. Yes, please. Sir, uh, I want to ask one question about uh, identification of poisonous mushrooms, sir. If we, we are in field, sir, then, uh, what is the criteria of uh, uh, sir? You know, uh, actually in field, actually in field, it is not at all possible by any easy method to identify your edible mushroom from the poisonous species, to separate your poisonous species from the edible species, right? Only thing is that you know that you have to you have to uh, contact with the local people, with the with the local communities who usually uh, who usually 
uh, undertake the undertake uh, we, we we usually consume different species or or you know you have to uh, some mushroom expert who can tell you yes this group of mushroom you should avoid otherwise you know it is very dangerous and you can't separate by any easy method your poisonous species Good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Kalin Zama. Yes, Joseph. please. Actually, my uh, my question was uh, about the how how to identify a poisonous mushroom. The the same question I have just I have just answered the a uh, few minutes back, two minutes back. You know that it is not possible in the field to uh, identify a poisonous species. You know it is uh, uh, only the people, uh, only the people who have the traditional knowledge. Maybe the older section of the community they can give you. Uh, if you are in a forest, they can give you best suggestion. Yes, you know, this species you should take or this not, right? Or if you have any. mycologist or any mushroom taxonomist with you yeah. he can also he can also guide you yes this group of mushroom you should avoid right okay. otherwise it is very dangerous you should not try with any a mushroom species which you do not know yes thank you sir one more question one more my name is joseph my question is What kinds of growth, growth hormones are found in mushrooms, and how we can reduce the maturation date of mushrooms for economical reasons? Huh? Please, ye ye pardon. Zor se bolega. Uh, what What kinds of growth hormones are found in mushrooms? What kind of poison? No, no, no. Growth hormones found in mushrooms, and how we can reduce the maturation date of mushrooms for economical purposes? I cannot understand your question. Sir, how we can reduce maturation rate of mushrooms for economical purposes? Please. See, I am working on the diversity and systematics of wild mushroom survey, collection, characterization, identification, and documentation. I believe that your uh, your question does not fall Sir. in this area. Any more questions? Good morning, sir. Yes. I have a question, sir. How to preserve this mushroom for future studies? Yes, you know that the uh, mushrooms they are very much sensitive, and you know that uh, in the field itself, we have seen that in the very next day uh, they are they are getting infected by another fungi. So how can you preserve? That is why what we do. We after uh, working with the macro morphology, or after undertaking macro morphological characterization in the field, or in my base camp, what we do, we uh, go for drying. We used to we used to use field dryer, and you know that we put our collections uh, in uh, uh, in low fire, and so uh, so that your mushroom. Uh, gets dried by the next morning and once your mushroom is dry you have to put them inside a zip lock bag and you can put this mushroom in your laboratory so the collection should be in dried condition you should preserve this species in dry condition Okay, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. 
<clears throat> Thank you so much, sir, for a very comprehensive insight on diversity and systematics of wild mushroom. Uh, once again, I will. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, before I invite our second speaker, uh, I would like to inform you all we have uh, one special person present with us. Um, so we would like to felicitate him, uh, uh, Engineer Mahendra Singh Lodi, scientist E in charge, Notice Regional Center, GB National Institute of Himalayan Environment and Sustainable Development. So I would like to request uh, Miss Nilam Yadi and Miss Yongam Kochi to kindly felicitate our special guest. Thank you so much, Vicky uh, Rao, sir. Um, now uh, we have a special song by uh, Nido Sukir from Vivek Ananda Kendra Vidalai uh, BA College New Jile. मेरा नाम नीलो मुंडे है, हम लोग आसे बीजेसी की इंडिविजुअल हम लोग अपने को एकाडमी के लिए क्या है मीडिया Oh, <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Mido Sukir, for a beautiful song. 
Um, now I invite our next eminent speaker, uh, Dr. B.S. Kolia, scientist E uh, from Dehradun. He will be talk on teridophytes, an overview, diversity and distribution, key future of dominant families. Before I invite him, I would like to call upon Dr. R.K. Rawat to give a detailed introduction of <laughs> His field of research lies in pterophyte taxonomy. He surveyed and documented pterophytes from all the hydrogeological regions of India, including Andaman and Kovara Islands. He had a research experience of nearly 35 years in the field of pterophytes. He started working on pterophytes in 1985 in Kovara Islands. During his PhD studies, he collected many interesting funds from the most progress of one of the Marias, and many of them were being for the rest of the Marias as well as one of the Marias. Dr. Pierce Kogia is one of the pioneer research models. He introduced the training of writing to the project in the form of the volumes of the program, one to us, volume one of the technology. He has also remained a documented Indian terrorist term to be part of our heterologist, CR heterocentric South British region, and now it presents for the Pompeian company of Harvard University USA. And the results were published in the form of two volumes on heterocentric South British region. Besides these five books, the new research career that the program has published. More than 120 research people from Terrorists. Besides the discoveries near the other general projects, more than 50 people in the and taxonomy knows and knowledge which are known for Terrorists is also discovered. What happened? Sex development has been survived and the level of clinical innovation found that we discovered that it was starting. For his contribution of terrorists, he has been awarded for contribution, as is the gold medal and honor by the law in the United States. To honor the AA, new species of terror on all the polyanos is named by the world that works. She has said that she is a thousand years and she has not so much of a shot. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. 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 Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Should I start? Yes, you may take your turn, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, um, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of the this symposium and Dr. Vinit Rao and his team, Arunachal Pradesh Science Center, my director and my seniors. Today, I have been assigned the topic that pedophytes uh, and overview, diversity and distribution and the key features of the dominant families. So I prepared my presentation just like for the MSc students level so they can understand about the pteridophytes. Uh, actually, pteridophytes are also termed as the plants and fernalized vascular cryptogams, lower vascular plants, seedless or flowerless vascular plants, lycophytes and ferns, and more recently, lycophytes and monileophytes. We all know that the vascular plants originated or appeared in about 420 million years ago in Silurian period and diversified in different lineages. Many of them were now become extinct and new plants are originated or evolved from the, those old plants. If we see the plant kingdom, we have different group of plants. We have algae, fungi, graphites, cedophytes, gymnosperm, and angiosperm. <laughs> 
if we see the alternation of generation the in lower plants or the thallophytes you will see the main plant body is the gametophyte however in the higher plants the main plant body is sporophyte the phase of gametophyte and the sporophyte is quite different yes me sir yes uh, sir your uh, ppt is not visible oh Sir, first minimize your screen and then open that PPT, sir. No, 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 no. After that, uh, share the screen, sir. Yeah, I have क्या हुआ ये तो आई नहीं है बिजली नहीं है इस बार अपन अपने जाते हैं इस बार करें ये कुछ करो मैं भी यही सीखने जाता हूँ Uh, uh, sir, uh, yes, Kholia, sir, are you there, sir?
Next day, you will be part of the day. What is the technical part of the day? Shami, good morning. We are having a good day. 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 We are having a good day.
tea break. Uh, thank you so much uh, for beautiful song. Uh, uh, due to technical uh, problem, uh, Dr. B.S. Kolya unable to attend uh, now. So we will have a tea break now. For after, for after five minutes, we will resume again our program. Thank you all for your patience.
I request all the participants kindly assemble in the room. We are going to start our program. Sir, uh, Before st starting, uh, uh, Dr. R. K. Robert will, P. K. Robert will uh, give detailed introduction of B. S. Dr. B. S. Collier. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, now I'm going to uh, give the brief of uh, Kholia sir, brief biodata. Uh, Dr. B.S. Kholia is scientist in Botanical Survey of India. His field of his specialization is Tidophyte Taxonomy. He surveyed and documented Tidophytes from all the phytogeographical -ge regions of India, including Andaman and Nicobar Islands. He has a research experience of nearly 35 years in the field of Tidophytes. He started working on tidophytes in 1985 in Kumai University, Nainital. During his PhD studies, he collected many interesting ferns from remote localities of uh, Kumai Himalayas, and many of them were new records for the best in Himalaya as well as for India. Dr. V.S. Kholia is one of the pioneering taxonomists who introduced a trend of writing pictorial flora in 2010 in the form of two volumes on the pictorial and flora of uh, Sikkim. He has also revised and documented Indian tidophytes jointly with world-renowned tidologists, C.R. Fraser Jenkins of British Museum, and nomenclature expert Professor K.N. Gandhi of Harvard University, USA. And the results were published in the form of three volumes and an annotated checklist of Indian tidophytes. Beside these five books, during his research career, Dr. Kholia has published more than 120 research papers on tidophytes. Besides the discovery, nearly a dozen of new taxa, more than 50 new records for India, and taxonomic notes and nomenclature notes on tidophytes, he also discovered first time sex reversal as a survival strategy in an endemic and critically endangered palm, Trachycarpus takil. For his contribution on tidophytes, he has been awarded for by Professor SSV Gold Medal and honored by Fellow of Indian Fund Society. To honor him, a new species of carrot fun Onikim Kolianum is named by two renowned cardiologists here, Fred Jenkins of England and S. Matsumato of Japan. Please, sir, start your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vini. Uh, <clears throat> I think my presentation is visible now. Yes, sir, it is visible. Oh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Rawat and his team, as well as the Arunachal Pradesh Science Center, my directors, Dr. Mao, and my colleagues. Good morning to all of the participants. I have presented my uh, prepared my presentation only for the keeping view of the new researchers or the uh, enthusiasts who is our enthusiasts of pedophiles. Uh, I already told you the ferns or tidophytes are called the ferns and fernalized vascular programs, lower vascular plants, seedless or flowerless vascular plants, lycophytes and ferns, and lycophytes and the monilophytes. So these are the <clears throat> terminal orders which are used for the tidophyte studies. We know the vascular plants appeared in about 420 million years ago in Silurian period and they are diversified in different lineages. Many of them become extinct and new plants are evolved or originated from them. If we see the alternation of generation in plants, we have different group of plant, algae, fungi, graphite, tridophyte, gymnosperm, and angiosperm. And there are two alternations of generations, uh, spherophyte and gametophyte. If we see the lower plants or thallophytes, the gametophyte phase is quite long and the sporophyte is uh, <coughs> grows on the gametophyte. And on the other hand, if we see the flowering plants and or the seed plants, the most of the form, the gametophyte is plant grows on seeds or flowers of the plant body. On the other hand, the ferns are unique among plant kingdom. They have both gametophyte 
and sporophyte phases are quite different and they are not dependent to each other so in the earlier our evolutionary biologists uh, placed the pteridophytes uh, between the intermediate position of thallophytes and seed plants but uh, according to the more modern molecular biologist or more modern phylogenetic tick scientist uh, they are thought to be the pteridophytes are thought to be the parallelly evolved with the flowering plants from the tracheo tracheophyta if from, from tracheophyta the lycophyte lineage is separated right? and the, there are another group separated euphyllophytes from the euphyllophytes the border fern and spermatophytes or seed plants so the ferns and seed plants are parallel not ferns are not much primitive than the seed plants however the lycophytes are primitive than the seed plants in the classical taxonomic approach pteridophytes are classified into xylopsida lycopsida spinopsida and teropsida four different groups are there however in the modern approach lycophytes are separated from the tracheophytes and they are they are euphyllophytes based on the in lycophytes the leaf is microphyllous that is the leaf is only one single midrib and no venison is there on the other hand the euphyllophytes the leaf is quite complex with a, a network of veins similarly the the monilophyte based on the moniliform vascular bundles the ferns are uh, grouped in the monilophytes and uh, based on the seed the gymnosperm and angiosperm are grouped in the another another uh, earlier the whisk found the silotales and equisetales horse tails were treated uh, under the lycophytes but uh, from the modern uh, taxonomic and more over on the on the basis of the modern phylogeny they were grouped in the true ferns though so based on his morphological classification morphological characters uh, bear host 1970 he wrote about that the whisk fern or the silotales are the true ferns but at that time the morphologist of that time did not accepted it and he was condemned so badly however now based on the molecular modern molecularology he the whisk ferns and hostels were grouped into the true ferns fossil history i have already told you who the This, this is the actually time. Actually, the ferns were evolved in the three ferns radiations. First radiation took place in Carboniferous period. At that time, most of the families of that time become extinct. The second radiation took place in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic junction around to fifty years, million years ago. And most of the primitive ferns which exist today were evolved about two thousand fifty million years ago. Among them, Osmundaceae, Marasiaceae. glycinaceae hymenophilaceae dipteridaceae metoniaceae cygiaceae and cythiaceae these species evolved in 2050 years of million years ago and some of them are still in the same position which were in the mesozoic era and they are called the living fossils the third ferns radiation quite primitive but they are very younger than the angiosperm and modern ferns evolved under the shadow of the angiosperm and still they are under the evolutionary process so these are some features of the pteridophytes they were the evolved the major vegetation of earth in the mesozoic era they were the major food of dinosaurs most of the coals petroleum are all the fossilized form of these pteridophytes distribution and diversity if we see the number according to number pteridophytes are the second highest group of the plants after angiosperm though gymnosperms were dominated once on the earth but they become slowly slowly their number is decreases and on the other hand other pteridophytes 
number of pedophiles are still increasing or they are still evolving so the pedophiles are called the survivor of the antiquity on the other hand there some at several places their diversity is much time um, higher than the angiosperm and most of the their diversity is uh, in the tropical rainforest are highly diverse in pedophyte fitted vegetations if we see the diversity and proportion of the present world flora uh, the pedophytes are very uh, rich in the nearby equator as one passes from the equator to poles their number gradually decreases you can see the indo malayan region is the one of the highest region here and the mexican and caribbean region is another highest region and as one passes from equator to poles their number gradually decreases pardon sir uh, ah. pardon sir your uh, ppt is not moving sir. madam i think it is the problem of my poor network oh okay sir ah. okay sir. is it visible right now no yeah sir it is visible but uh, this one is uh, it is in second slide it's oh. not moved so what can i do for that <laughs> okay uh, sir you have to like uh, type uh, type that one okay then you can start another presentation no problem if my slide is not moving here it is moving actually with me okay okay so ah, with me it is moving i think this is due to poor network uh, otherwise uh, i have to reload uh, my uh, reopen the pdf form reopen the file no no Sorry. pdf pdf slide i think so my slide so is moving okay. actually uh, so it's okay you continue sir okay no yeah. problem uh, the slides are not visible so if i have uh, the, the picture i am showing here is the a board map where the maximum number of uh, fauns are in the equator on the other hand if we see the percentage of flora in pedophyte percentage in flora we have some islands where a uh, uh, pedophyte percentage is 70% if there are 100 species of plant among these 100 species uh, 70 species are ferns and 30 species are another group of plant in many islands this is because due to the pedophytes most of these islands the uh, southeast asian island or atlantic islands or you can see the pacific islands most of these islands are volcanic in origin and volcanic in origin and the fern spore have high diversity this dispersal characters fern spore can is dispersed from one continent to another continent therefore the ferns are the first colonizer on these islands these volcanic islands therefore the number of ferns are very high in these islands if we see the diversity of ferns in india we have 1150 species out of 1166 11600 species so more than 10% of world pedophytes occurs only in 2.4% of indian landmass so we have uh, out of 38 fern world fern third family we have 33 were families in india if we see the number of genera and species in india we have uh, 125 native genera one uh, genera of ferns and we have total 100 and 1145 species out of which uh, we have some additional sub species uh, 53 additional sub species total taxa of uh, pteropods in india are 1198 the indian pteropods are an assemblage of european elephant sino himalayan elephant afro arabian elephant south east asian elephant and it's on endemic so we have some 70 species of european elephant we have uh, around 500 to between 500 and 600 species of sino himalayan elephants we have 200 to 
from the southeast asian element we have some uh, a few the dozens of afro arabian elements and some most of the we have some indo malayan sorry indo lankan elements are also there uh, which are mainly uh, confined in the southern india we have on, only uh, 66 taxa of uh, endemics uh, which depend about 5% of the endemic species which are belongs to the 17 families and 25 genera we have 16 endemic taxa in himalaya four in andaman and nicobar and the remaining uh, more than 45 in peninsular india or southern india if we see the phytogenetic uh, region wise distribution uh western himalaya has uh, 394 species of pteridophytes eastern uh, sikkim himalaya 560 sikkim himalaya contains darjeeling and sikkim and arunachal himalaya has about 700 species north east india 520 species central india or the mp rajasthan around 80 species and we have around 350 species in southern india and 120 species in panel andaman and nicobar islands so the largest we have uh, for the fauna allies we have around 90 species of fauna allies belonging to the xylotum two species isoites five species upergia 27 17 species lycopodium two species lycopodia la um, nine species lycopodia la two species chelidella 55 species and we see equisetum with four species on the diapridaceae teridaceae polypodaceae ursaceae thylepridaceae and aspidaceae are and sile are the largest family with more genera and more diverse family these are the dominant families in indian flora on the other hand we have some more generic families like aspidaceae azoleaceae kyrioplidaceae cyteaceae Dipteridaceae, Equisetaceae, Plagiogyraceae, Nephrolepidaceae, uh, Monocosoraceae, Salvinaceae, and Silagnellis. These families are represented by only one genus. We have some very rare genera like Botrychium. Botrychium is confined to only Himalayas. Cebotium is only in far northeastern India, like Assam and uh, Arunachal Pradesh. in the tropical assam and arunachal pradesh region silotum is also confined to central india and south india so the, we have some very they, they have very limited uh, distribution actually brenia is confined to the only meghalaya and some mizoram asterosora pelia is confined to himalayas heterogonium is also confined so we have some genera which have very rare distribution in media if we see the habitat diversity the ferns can grow in the ravine forest slopes open slopes grasslands they are also thicket forming they grow as lithophyte on rocks and walls uh, they are epiphyte on the plants they are have creeping climbing and they are also hydrophytes Traditionally, ferns are used as foods and beverages, vegetables, cattle bed, and in very traditional medicinal systems also they are used in many places. They also maintain soil fertility. They are also used in litter trapping, maintaining the soil humidity, regulates the soil microbe microbe system. Uh, they also play important role in human cycling. they are the first colonizer of the soil in many landslide areas recently they are used in the bioremediation of arsenic chloride etc so i think the key features of families with i uh, before going the uh key features of the family i would like to because it is not visible slides so i think i have to <laughs> conclude here otherwise i have prepared the slides for every family and key characters of every families of the indian tetrapods 
Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir, okay. for your presentation and uh, providing us a uh, uh, detailed overview of Derrida files, its uh, diversity and distribution. Uh, mm -hmm. Due to like uh, some technical problem, we couldn't uh, see your PPT, sir, but it's a very nice presentation. So if there is any question from participant, you may ask now regarding the same topic. Yeah, I can answer. Good afternoon. My name is Kalin Dhamma. Uh, my question is, why this Terezo fights is called as the snake of the plant kingdom? What? Pardon? Why this Terezo fights plants are called the snake of the plant kingdom? Snail? A snake of the plant kingdom. A snake, sorry, snake. Okay, okay. Not all Terezo fights are called the snake of the plant kingdom because in most of the Terezo fights, the fiddle head or the crozier is snake like. So they are called the snake part, I think. Any question from participant? Okay, then thank you so much, sir. I think there's no question. So you. moving on to the agenda, we uh, we have our third uh, we have third esteemed speaker, Dr. M. U. Seraf, scientist F. He will be talk on conservation of biodiversity, BSI respect perspective. Uh, I request Dr. B.K. Rawal, scientist E, HODBSI, Itanagar, to give detailed introduction of uh, Dr. M. U. Seraf. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Dr. Kolia, sir, you have given a nice uh, presentation, but due to technical problem, the slides was not, uh, uh, were not moving that time. Sir, it was very nice presentation, sir. So now I'm going to... Uh, uh, give, giving the brief of uh, our uh, respected sir, M. U. Sarif sir. Now he is the in charge of Botanical Survey of India Southern Regional Center. Dr. M. U. Sarif, Dr. M. U. Sarif pursued his master degree from University of Mysore in 1986 with the specialization in cytogenetics and plant breeding. He was awarded the PhD degree by the University of Mysore in 1994 on taxonomy and tissue culture of A and M plants. After serving at St. Philomena College, Mysore and Rubber Road, Mangalore, he joined BSI as a senior scientist in 2001. He has conducted extensive studies on floristic diversity and ethnobotany of uh, ab aboriginal tribes of A and M, uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands and came out with very interesting study on the ethnobotany of uh, aboriginal tribes of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which had received great appreciation by the national and state government institutes. He had carried out ex situ and in situ conservation studies of South Indian orchids and some rare and endangered plants. Dr. Sarif has also worked on the aromatic and medicinal plants of North Indian region and instrumental in raising aromatic plant section inside the AJC Bose Indian Botanical Garden, Havda. Dr. Sarif has published 55 research papers on tissue culture of aromatic and medicinal plants, floristic diversity, and ethno-medicinal botanical studies of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and orchid diversity of Western uh, plants. He has co-authored a book Jarvas of Andaman Islands, which is published by BSI, BSI Kolkata. He has edited seven angiospermic families for the second volume of Flora of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which is under preparation at BSI Kolkata. <laughs> Dr. Sarif is also the team leader 
for the forthcoming volume 28 of Flora of India, which involves 24 NGOs from family and about 504 texa. He has written many of the popular articles in the local paper, as well as in the magazines of the Andaman Nicobar Islands, Port Blair. Presently, he is working on the... <coughs> Uh, he, now he's uh, the in charge of uh, Southern Regional Center, so I'm a tool. Thank you, sir. Good, good morning. Uh, is I'm audible? Yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Vinit Rawat, uh, for a brief introduction of me. Uh, shall I continue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. My, my, my uh, slides are visible. Yes, sir. My presentation is visible. Conservation of biodiversity, a BSA perspective, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I thank the organizers of uh, this uh, three-day seminar on uh, uh, capacity building of taxonomy, uh, uh, capacity building training program on plant taxonomy, systematics, and biodiversity. Uh, in this connection, I thank uh, the organizers uh, of Arunachal Pradesh Science Center and uh, Arunachal Pradesh uh, State Council for Science and Technology and even DST. At the outset, I thank all these uh, three organizers. And uh, even uh, I thank uh, our beloved director, Dr. A. M. Mao and uh, Dr. Vinit Kumar Rawat, scientist and head of uh, Itanagar Center, Regional Center, for providing me a platform for sharing the experiences that I have just gained in these two decades of my work in Botanical Center of India, especially in the regional centers like Andaman and Nicobar Regional Center, then at uh, AJC Bose Indian Botanic Garden, and then at uh, Southern Regional Center of uh, Koyamutur. Friends, today I am just uh, talking on the topic conservation of biodiversity, a BSC perspective. We know very well how nicely the biodiversity is influencing the life of uh, humankind day to day in the day to day activities. It has become the essence of life for each and every person. And yesterday, Dr. SS Dash also in the first lecture, he also showed how important uh, this biodiversity is having, uh, especially even in the documentation of uh, traditional knowledge also, it is taking a leading hand uh, the, from our, almost all the sites, uh, probably from the sustainable use of some of the ethno-medicinal plants also, it is so much important. So before going to the topic, uh, this conservation of biodiversity, a BSF perspective today, just a brief introduction about the department to which I just uh, belong to. Botanical Survey of India is the organization coming under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, New Delhi, and it is committed for documentation and conservation of plastic diversity of our country. Committed for documentation and conservation of plastic diversity of our country, a very great uh, task which has been assigned to the, all the scientists of uh, Botanical Survey of India, that is the conservation of plastic diversity of our country. And let us see what is the chemistry involved in this conservation of plastic diversity of country. And how BSI, with all his, uh, regional centers, how it is, uh, how it is uh, this one, how it is uh, influencing this uh, work, let us see. It is having, BSA is having its uh, headquarter at Calcutta with 11 regional centers spread all over India, like Southern Regional Center at Koyamutur, which I am now heading. The next center, the next regional center comes the Deccan Regional Center at Hyderabad. After that, we are having Western Regional Center at Pune. Then we are having Central Circle at uh, Jodhpur, Allahabad then arid zone circle at Jodhpur, then we are having northern circle at Dehradun, Sikkim Himalayan circle at Gangtok, then Arunachal Pradesh center at Itanagar, eastern circle, regional center is at Shillong, then we are having uh, Andaman and Nicobar regional center at Port Blair, and recently in 2019, one more new center at Solon, Himachal has been opened. So with, these are the 11 regional centers all over India, which are carrying out work in one way or the other in documentation and conservation of plastic diversity of a country. So I told it is having its regional center, it is having its headquarter at Calcutta. Besides having headquarter at Calcutta, four important divisions are also there in Calcutta. And these uh, four divisions are, one is AJC Bose Indian Botanic Garden, which is present at Haura. Inside that AJC Bose Indian Botanic Garden, we are having Central National Herbarium, 
acronym as CNH. Then we are having Central Botanical Laboratory again inside the AJC Bus Indian Botanic Garden. And coming to the Calcutta in uh, near Park Street, we are having one more section that is industrial section of Indian Museum. In the Indian Museum also, BSI's uh, museum section is also present. So with this uh, network, this BSI is carrying out work on documentation and conservation of plastic diversity of our country. And besides this, one more uh, I want to mention, one more, uh, some uh, 10 years back, one more garden has been added to this complete uh, setup, uh, and that is BGR, Botanic Garden of India Republic at Noida. So Ministry of Environment and Forest is, has given the responsibility of establishing and uh, maintaining this uh, Botanical Garden of India Republic at Noida to the Botanical Center of India. Uh, they, and it wanted to make it as a very, very important uh, botanic garden because many of the foreign delegates who are visiting the ministry of New Delhi, they used to bring to this uh, Botanic Garden of Indian Republic. So they want to make it as a very active center of uh, exit to conservation at Noida. BGR, especially Botanic Garden of India Republic. I'll be showing some of the slides of that one in my preceding slides. So now a brief history. Botanical Center of India was established in uh, in the year 1890, 13th February 1890, and the first and foremost ex officio honorary director of BSI is none other than Sir George King. In 1890, he just established this botanical garden. Of course, after the establishment of this botanical, botanical Center of India, sorry, not botanical, but botanical Center of India in 1890 by Sir George King, nearly for 50 to 60 years, the work of botanical Center of India was uh, not at all going as uh, it has been thought. Okay, Britishers were there, they were taking much of the interest in documenting some of the regional flora, some of the plants they were describing. But overall, the activities of botanical Center of India were not at all taking place in the great uh, in, in the brisk manner what it, uh, it was it to be done. So in 1952, E.K. Jani Kemal, the Iron Lady of Indian Botany, the first doctorate holder of Indian Botany, she was invited by the then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. From, uh, she was working as a cytogenetist in uh, City Darlington's lab. And uh, uh, Dr., uh, our uh, then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru just invited her to return back to India and reorganized the activities of Botanical Center of India, which she agreed. And she came back in 1952. And in 1954, she presented an action plan for the reorganization of Botanical Center of India. And the reorganization was done with the aim of building the much desired inventory of the country's rich plant resources. And the second aim was to carry out intensive exploration surveys and to document the plant resources in the form of local, local floras, district floras, state floras, and national floras and to have a custodian of authentic herbarias and whatever the specimens which are which have to be collected and conserved. So this is the way how the BSI just came up and got reorganized by the special officer on duty, Dr. E.K. Jani Kemal, the Iron Lady, and the first doctorate holder in the plant botany. Coming to the objectives of Botanical Center of India, Botanical Center of India is having five important objectives. They are our first objective already I just told, collection, identification, conservation of floristic diversity of our country. The second objective is publication of regional floras and red data books. And of course, now ministry is insisting on green data books also, which pertains to the botanical gardens, the data related to uh, botanical gardens. And then the third objective is setting up of regional herbarias, botanic gardens, and museums. The fourth objective is to conserve and multiply rare and endangered plants. And the fifth objective is documentation of traditional bar, tribal bar, ethno-botanical knowledge. So here I'm showing some of the figures of some of the very important plants. One is this uh, pride of India, or the, uh, the, the, the beautiful plant, the plant of heaven, Amersha nobilis, uh, the dancing doll tree it is called. Then we are having Nepenthes cassiana, and some of the uh, insects, the vertical section of the picture of this uh, Nepenthes uh, picture to show the trapped insects. And this is uh, Venezuelan rose or uh, Brownia hybrida, a very beautiful uh, legume which Britishers has these two. One is uh, Amherstia nobilis and one is another is the uh, Brownia coccinia. Britishers has uh, introduced these uh, rare plants uh, in the AJC Bus Indian Botanic Garden. We are having the avenues of Amherstia, we are having the avenues of Brownia coccinia, the exotic legumes what the Britishers has uh, introduced. So these are the, some of the rare plants which I just wanted to just highlight before you people. Uh, yes, before going to the next aspect, I wanted to tell this plastic diversity now, 
plastic diversity i told a very great uh, task has been given to this botanical sir of india scientist to conserve collect identify and conserve the plastic diversity of country of course yesterday dr dash also has told to know the complete uh, mechanism of this plastic diversity the identification of the individual elements is very very important so that is the that is the way there there only the lie there only lies the much of the great work of the field which is very much involved there and expertise also is needed an army of experts are needed especially to understand the plastic elements of our country which are existing so there that's why it is a very big work what uh, the ministry has uh, put on the responsibility of botanic sir of india i told in the second objective we are having setting up of herbarias of course now itself uh, a network of herbarium also of bsi is existing all the 13 regional circles are having their herbarias and their accessions what are involved of course among all these 13 uh, herbarias the biggest one is central national herbarium which is considered as a mother of all herbariums of our country and more than 2.5 million accessions are there in the central national herbarium including uh, uh, in, uh, in addition we are having 15000 type specimens present in central national herbarium along with that one all regional circles are having their own herbarium accessions and the, the number of the herbarium accessions has been shown this is the central national herbarium building and this is the interior of the herbarium which has been kept in these compactors the herbarium sheets has been allayed and this is a type section of central national herbarium so totally 31 lakh um, herbarium accessions has been maintained by different regional circles as well as the central national herbarium of botanical sir of india this is for your kind information besides having the besides having this network of herbaria all regional circles except two regional circles one is that deccan regional center hyderabad and the second one is solan at himachal they are having their own botanic garden also where active ex situ conservation activities are going on here i have shown the network of the botanical gardens what the botanical sir of india is having among all these botanical gardens again the mother of all botanic garden is ajc bose indian botanic garden situated howrah which runs to an area of 273 acres established in the year 1787 by none other than colonel robert kit i will be talking about that one in my future slides here some of the slides i have shown this is the front uh, gate of this ajc bose indian botanic garden then this is national Ar uh, national arcadium and experimental garden extra national arcadium and experimental garden associated with southern regional center and it is situated at the airport where we are conserving the rare and endemic orchids of western ghats beside that many of the rt plants of western ghats has been conserved and this is the garden associated with southern regional center and this is the view of botanical garden of india republic which has been started in 10 years back by ministry of environment and forest and by the and a metro also runs inside the in 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 the midst of the botanical garden a metro also runs as the bjr has come in an area of 160 acres on the yamuna express road complete area has fully developed and so much of metro botanic garden botanic garden bus stand and some of the so much of uh, development has taken place in the but a bgar area just i wanted to just show a overall view of this bgar which is present in 30 sector 13 of noida noida at uh, new delhi and uh, i told uh, the objective publication of regional flora publication of red data books uh, publication of uh, checklist uh, these are the these are the some of the activities here some of the flora uh, flora what the bsi is releasing just uh, just to understand the importance of this publication i shown beside that every year bsi publishes plant discoveries in which all the new plants new plant species what are which are reported by the scientists of botanics of india are completely enlisted in this uh, plant discoveries for the for the uh, for the understanding of uh, other scientific uh, departments which are working on this plant science this is a very important document especially on world and on day 5th june uh, that is on 5th june uh, of world and day our honorable um, minister of environment and forest releases this plant discoveries besides that brain sir of india is having its scientific journal nilambo in which all the scientific articles are being published yes coming a little go further i told the first objective is conservation of uh, plastic diversity of country to me since i come under uh, to me uh, to us uh, since we come under uh, the department of uh, plant sciences we call it as plastic diversity overall the term biodiversity overall the term biodiversity is a very very important term today and it is an umbrella term which encompasses all the living entities which are categorized themselves it has become an essence of life on the plant kingdom and it is influencing all the different facets of uh, the human kind uh, in all over the world very very it is taken into consideration 
so it is completely concentrating and it is influencing on uh, this uh, social aspect it is social facet also it is influencing cultural facet also it is influencing environmental facet also it is influencing as well as economical facet also is influencing so overall biodiversity has become a very very important and it has become a sovereign property of any nation under consideration we can very well say a very aspect and the sustainable utilization of biodiversity has become a necessity earlier earlier biodiversity was conserved in the form of a fashion but now it has become a necessity to conserve the biodiversity of course if you take uh, history back if you see the history back many of the botanical gardens botanical paths were being constructed by many of the rulers some maratha rulers mogal rulers mogal rulers in the form of chashme shahi in the form of nusrat bagh in the form of mogal 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 bagh all these uh, gardens uh, were completely of course in south if you take lal bagh botanic garden even uti botanic garden some of the rulers they started uh, these botanic gardens to conserve this uh, biodiversity in a fashion but today this same biodiversity which has earlier uh, conserved as fashion it has become a complete necessity to conserve this biodiversity rather than as fashion so that's why i wanted to tell very very important now biodiversity is emerging as a science rather than a subject some of the people and people some of them they are telling even it has become a political issue also with regard to this biodiversity is concerned like that many of the aspects are coming many of the opinions are coming of course for this biodiversity totally 14 uh, definitions has been given two definitions one is by united nation and another definition given by iuc and international union of conservation nature and natural resources these two definitions has been uh, accepted the definitions total 14 definitions has come up uh, with regard to this uh, biodiversity of course the the iuc uh, accepted uh, definition is the sum total of genes species and ecosystems in a given region and this definition was proposed by macmanus and norse even though the biodiversity is existing from long long years from the inception of the mother earth here this uh, simplest definition for this biodiversity as sum total of genes species and ecosystems in a given region was given in the year 1890 by macmanus and norse besides having this uh, definition of giving this uh, definition of this um, uh, total definition of this biodiversity this biodiversity as the sum total of genes species and ecosystems in a given region the categorization of biodiversity is also very very important yesterday dr dash also has shown biodiversity has been categorized into three forms one is genetic diversity the second one is species diversity and third one is ecosystem diversity of course some people they have categorized it also as uh, alpha diversity beta diversity and gamma diversity some people also term it as intracellular diversity intercommunal diversity intracommunal diversity and landscape diversity like this also categorization is very much there of course categorization is very very important because the total if you take the total uh, diversity into consideration if you see plant diversity we are having now as on today 50000 12 species in our country as the plant plant diversity and on the contrary we are having 80000 animal diversity again if we take this 50000 12 species of plant diversity in consideration we are having angiosperms nearly 18800 angiosperms are there 82 gymnosperms are there 1198 as dr kolia was telling 1198 uh, pteridophytes are there 2786 bryophytes are there they can algae 7434 algae are there fungi 15447 fungi are there bacteria 1239 and lichens 2917 uh, 917 lichen species are also there so a vast diversity of uh, plant biodiversity is existing in our country of course india is a one among the <coughs> 17 mega diverse countries of the world some of the mega diverse countries you may be knowing brazil china mexico australia ecuador peru Uh, indonesia malaysia madagascar all these are some of the mega diverse countries and india is one among mega diverse countries it has been gifted with the huge biodiversity especially both plant diversity as well as uh, animal diversity but how to know this uh, <coughs> important components of this biodiversity which are existing so there needs the classification besides classification we also need the army of expertise we need an army of expertise in pteridophytes we need an army of expertise in gymnosperms we need army of expertise in bryophytes we need in angiosperms even again in angiosperms different families are there one uh, scientist itself to document uh, archaeologists itself complete surface will be completing so imagine how many families are there knowing different and a uh, huge work is very uh, much well that's why i told a huge task of conservation of biodiversity has been given by, by ministry of environment forest to portal sir of india 
and similarly the funnel diversity to zoological survey of india so that's why a huge uh, work uh, and continuous uh, task uh, task force has to be work to be carried out to document this biodiversity which is existing in our country and different aspects are also there and some of the aspects i'll be touching in my future slides of course what to tell is biodiversity is now a very very uh, umbrella term which encompasses all the living entities it is the essence of life on this mother earth i can even say so how much importance is biodiversity possesses that much uh, threats also this is uh, this uh, this is having so that's why some pe <coughs> some people are telling there are three positive mantras for biodiversity and these three positive mantras is one is exploration or inventorization the second one is documentation and the third one is conservation these are the three positive mantras and how much importance this uh, biodiversity possesses that much threat it is possessing that's why three negative mantras are also affecting on this biodiversity and these three negative mantras is one is urbanization the second one is deforestation and the third one is refrigeration the refrigeration hugely contributing cfcs that is chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons aerosols halons and what not the different types of uh, solvents which are being used in rubberized industries as well as in the agriculture field they are completely affecting causing out these greenhouse effects and thereby affecting the biodiversity so that's why conservation of biodiversity is very very essential today and it has become a necessity rather than a passion what i have told some people are telling the threat to the biodiversity or the loss of biodiversity is more serious than any thermonuclear reaction like that so that's why we should completely conserve this biodiversity conservation of biodiversity is very very essential because if there is no minimum balance of biodiversity existing in any given region the complete ecosystem will collapse and the complete food chain will collapse so thereby we should be very careful that the ecosystem should not get uh, collapse otherwise many of the species will completely disappear along with that they even disappear many of the associated species so that's why we should be very carefully conserve this biodiversity so this is the background what i wanted to tell so besides having the <coughs> categorization of biodiversity into three types that is genetic diversity species diversity ecosystem diversity recently in 1997 haywood has added one more category to this one and that is none other than cultural diversity which pertains to tribal knowledge or indigenous knowledge or ethnobotanical knowledge so these are the different uh, categorizations of this uh, biodiversity and i will be touching on these uh, different aspects of this biodiversity in my preceding slides of course here one slide i have just brought this is the best example of setting up of biodiversity park by our beloved uh, and active researcher uh, plant uh, researcher of plant science professor c r babu the the, the earlier uh, vice chancellor this on the the earlier yeah. acting vice chancellor of that uh, delhi university uh, c r babu he had taken a challenge of setting up a biodiversity park in yamuna express in the 2001 he was uh, uh, he was given the Uh, responsibility of setting up a biodiversity park in 156 acres of land which is just having some salt loving bushes and common weeds so he has completely the pro vice chancellor of delhi university cr babu completely changed the scenario of this 156 acres of the area a very very dried area into a very very excellent uh, uh, biodiversity park and now many of the wild animals are also completely neil neeli gai are visiting this uh, biodiversity park and some of the wetlands which has been some of the lakes which has been established even many of the birds are also visiting this uh, uh, this biodiversity park it has become a very great example and the ministry of environment forest is uh, now asking other uh, other chief ministers of other states to set up a uh, step of biodiversity park in their districts or in their some of their headquarters watch or which is there and even some of the foreign countries like sri lanka and bangladesh also has taken this example of this development of biodiversity park so he has uh, uh, he this shows how important the uh, conservation of biodiversity uh, it bears uh, in this present uh, situation now coming to conservation of this biodiversity <coughs> there are two important aspects of conservation of biodiversity one is in the way of in situ conservation and the second one is ex situ conservation in situ conservation is without disturbing the plant entity or animal entity in his original habitat conserving it its original habitat is referred to as in situ conservation 
and the second one is exotic conservation where the plant entity or the animal entity or the whatever the element which is to be conserved lifting it from its original habitat bringing it to other place either it may be botanic garden or it may be any laboratory conditions and giving near natural conditions and conserving is referred to as exotic conservation i'll be concentrating more on the exotic conservation rather than in-situ conservation because of the paucity of the time in-situ conservation you know of course the forest department is the chief custodian of this in-situ conservation work and it is being done by three methodologies three methods one is by setting up biosphere's protected areas and uh, some of the uh, some of the national parks some of the sanctuaries it is done by the, uh, the by these three methods in situ conservation is being carried out of course all over the world if you take there are 375 bio, bio biosphere reserves existing in 85 countries in india also there are 18 biosphere reserves full fledged biosphere reserves are there and still some more biosphere reserves are coming up 50 tiger reserves are also there protected areas are also there some of the biosphere reserves in the form of uh, similpal biosphere reserve we are in gulf of manar biosphere reserve we are in nilgiri biosphere reserve then manas biosphere reserve nanda devi biosphere reserve is also there then we are having uh, uh, great nikobar Bi biosphere reserve so like this uh, kanchenjunga biosphere reserve so some of the biosphere reserves are there where an active in situ conservation work is going on of course bsi is concentrating on a more on ex situ conservation rather than working on in situ conservation of course uh, no how whatever the work which we are do doing we are providing all the all the backup information to forest department for in situ conservation so coming to exit to conservation again exit to conservation is carried out by three important methods one is by tissue culture methods the second one is by botanic gardens and the third one is by gene banks so i'll be talking little more on this exit to conservation because bsa is directly involved in exit to conservation activities of course tissue culture tissue culture if you just take the background of course this is a very important technique by which conservation of some of the rt plants some of the medicinal plants can be very well brought about this is nothing but culturing or maintenance of cells tissues organs and embryos on artificial media under aesthetic conditions so tissue culture is a, no doubt a very potential technique for conservation of some of the rt plants as well as medicinal plants and some of the yeah, some of the departments like uh, nbpgr then we are having ms somnathan research foundation of course in bsi also at one is at shillong and second one it has uh, in uh, national academy of experimental garden air card some tissue culture work is going on where some of the medicinal plants and as well as orchids are has completely put for uh, tissue culture propagation and they are even propagated and they have rehabilitated in their original habitat also with the help of forest department of course here i am just showing you know, i am not giving going deep into this tissue culture aspect because of the paucity of time i am also very short topic is very big of course tissue culture uh, once if i am touching upon we are tissue culture we have to remember the the german scientist gottlieb heberland 1902 who just put for this uh, concept of this tissue culture he this the, he proposed this tissue culture aspect uh, based on the innate capacity of the plant cells that is called totipotency in which each and every cell is having the capacity to develop into a complete uh, plant so based on that he proposed this tissue culture aspect and now more than 300 uh, laboratories uh, in our country are working on this tissue culture aspect and uh, uh, generating a huge economy for the country so so that's why he, this shows the potentiality of this uh, tissue culture technique which was proposed by gottlieb heberland in the year 1902 of course gottlieb heberland even though he proposed uh, of course he is regarded as unlucky scientist even though his uh, his uh, his uh, findings were not appreciated by scientific fraternity later uh, exactly 32 years in the year 1932 to 35 three scientists uh, uh, gothret nobecott and white they rediscovered the work of uh, gottlieb heberland and tissue culture became a very potential technique for the propagation of some of the rt plants as well as many of the example important plants so here i am just showing how we just carried out uh, the tissue culture of some of the orchids uh, in our national aquarium and experimental garden here card and here is the tissue culture of silogen nitida a species which has been completely the the the, 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 pro, the protocol for this propagation of this uh, uh, this is completely standardized beside this uh, we have even uh, propagated uh, this one cymbidium uh, species also as well as uh, some of this uh, uh, some other uh, orchid species of western ghats we have just uh, put for this tissue culture and some of the plants are under uh, sale also for common public in this uh, national academy and experimental garden and beside this <coughs> in tissue culture once we come for the especially for this uh, propagation of rt plants or the medicinal plants two important aspects one is micro propagation the second one is uh, keeping long term cultures 
or the entrapment of the cells can very well be carried out in tissue culture with which we can have the plants uh, independent of time and season we can really have long term cultures here is an example of artemisia pellens which has been carried out the cultures of nearly 2 to 3 years can very well be conserved in the tissue culture lab and whenever we need the plant we can take some of these cultures and we can we can very well uh, we can very well uh, subculture it on fresh media and we can have the plant independent of time and season so this is uh, one of the very important aspect of this tissue culture one is micro propagation in short time and space many of the plants can be obtained by standardization of this uh, media uh, media composition especially in this media the very important inclusion is growth regulators in the form of auxins cytokinins and uh, zipperlins by the permutation and combinations of this uh, auxins and uh, cytokinins uh, we can very well bring about some of the rapid multiplication of some of the plants and it is to be standardized in the uh, the protocol is to be standardized so this is the aspect of this feature sir very briefly i am touching upon that one and then some of the plants which has been propagated which can be even bamboo also a very, very economical important plant has been propagated in tissue culture and uh, so tissue culture is a very important technology nbpg is also having uh, this gene banks of course ecrisat in hyderabad is the asia's biggest gene bank which is existing and conserving many of the plants uh, in the form of uh, this uh, by 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 the technique of this tissue culture ms somnathan also many of the rt and medicinal plants are being uh, propagated by this uh, by this tissue culture so this is the background about the first method by tissue culture the second one is by ex situ conservation is by botanic gardens of course botanic gardens is very very important uh, aspect for the ex situ conservation and bsi is having a network of nine uh, botanical gardens and beside the botanic gardens associated with uh, associated with botanic sarai of india in its regional centers the other departmental botanic gardens in the form of nbra national botanical uh, nbra national botanical research institute lucknow then uh, regional plant resource center at uh, bhuneshwar rprc at bhuneshwar then we are having uh, transdisciplinary university at uh, at bangalore that is earlier known as frlst and then tbj a tropical botanical garden and research uh, institute at uh, palod uh, trivandrum there also much of the ex situ conservation work on this rt as well as uh, medicinal plants uh, is coming uh, is under progress so botanical gardens i told they are the living repositories of the living repositories of the plants of different phytogeographical uh, regions where the plants can be very well effectively they can be conserved and they can be propagated and they can be rehabilitated again in their original habitat so botanical gardens are very potential areas where in a active ex situ conservation work can be carried out a very important data research data can also be very well generated and comparative study between experimental botany and modern taxonomy can be carried out in this botanical garden and these are the places where active research material can be generated they can be supplied to many of the research organizations who are, are in need of the some of the rare plants so, so botanical gardens are the places where the effective conservation of rt plants can be brought about and effective data and effective many of the phd programs can also be conducted and these are the active places where many of the environmental awareness programs can be conducted educational programs can be conducted for the student and potential potential information can be generated so botanical gardens are very very important areas with regard to ex situ conservation i told bsi is having a network of botanical garden the mother of all botanical garden is ajc bose indian botanic garden situated at howra and besides that all nine regional regional centers are having their botanical gardens uh, they are conserving the plants which are uh, present in their local areas collection and uh, propagation of those plants and completely documenting the phenological data of uh, all these plants is carrying out in the network of this botanical survey of india's botanical gardens so this is the background of botanical gardens every botanical garden will have different uh, sections in the form of arboretum where trees are conserved then they will be having uh, bamboo sitam here bamboo will be there palms pomatums then fernary will be there then beside that arcadium will be there and so like this different sections will be there even tissue culture section will also be there in many of the botanical gardens and these are the some of the sections where the active ex situ conservation can be carried out so botanical garden is a very important uh, center for active ex situ conservation so uh, one among the all these botanical gardens is mother of all botanical gardens the acharya jindishan was indian botanic garden which was started by the britishers in the year 1787 and the first person who started this garden is 17 in 1787 is lieutenant colonel robert kidd the then honorary superintendent Uh, he was the uh, honorary superintendent of the botanical garden for 6 years 87 to 93 and he was uh, not at all given the salary for his superintendency in botanical garden because he was the colonel in 
uh, Fort Williams, uh, Calcutta military board of Fort Williams, Calcutta. So Britishers they just uh, giving the salary of uh, Colonel, and he was uh, he acted as uh, honorary superintendent of this botanical garden. Of course, this botanical garden started by in the uh, by the by the East India East India Company in the name of East India Company's garden or company bagan. Later, the name was changed as Royal Botanic Garden when the garden was taken by the Royal Royal family of this uh, Britishers. It was changed as Royal Botanical Garden, and once the independence was obtained, it was changed as Indian Botanical Garden. And in 2019, the then uh, MOE of NCC, Jairam Ramesh, uh, uh, just uh, just uh, inform, informed to change it as. Acharya Jagdish Chandra Bose Indian Botanic Garden to commemorate the achievements of uh, Acharya Jagdish Chandra Bose, a land physiologist from West Bengal. It was changed as Acharya Jagdish Chandra Bose Indian Botanic Garden, a very important center for ex situ conservation. I'll be showing some of the slides how the active work with regard to conservation of biodiversity is being brought about in this uh, botanic garden. You will be seeing some of these uh, slides in, in, in the preceding slides. So the garden was first started by Colonel Robert Kidd in 1787. Again, this Colonel Robert Kidd started his botanic garden with a very great vision. So much of background information is there. History, if you go, time is very short. But still, just briefly, I touch upon that one, and then because many things are related, important things are there. Colonel Robert Kidd got an idea to establish this botanic garden because in Saharanpur area of uh, uh, in India, some botanical gardens are coming. I told some of the Mughal rulers they also started some of the gardens in the form of Mughal garden, then Chashme Shahi, Nusrat Bagh, and in Saharanpur also one botanic garden was coming up. And uh, William Rasborough was uh, taking some interest for conservation of uh, RET plants, some of the rare plants in that Saharanpur area. Uh, for the setting up the botanic garden of course in south uh, hyderabad his father uh, hyderabad his son tipu sultan they were establishing this uh, uh, lalbagh botanic garden so this uh, colonel robert kid he was just uh, very near to this haura uh, botanic garden one area shalimar he got an idea to set up a botanic garden and wrote a letter to east india company to set up a botanic garden but immediately the east india company didn't give the not to set up the botanic garden because they they just marked on this uh, For on this Colonel Robert Kidd, part Colonel Robert Kidd, we have come here to this country to take away what are the resources which are existing in this in this country, but you are want to remain here and say establish the botanic garden like that. Demark so immediately writes a letter again, second letter he mentions no 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 instead of taking one bag of economically important plants, the products of economically important plants, taking ten bags at one time is a very very noteworthy thing. So that one another thing is. If we are having a botanic garden, we can very well have some of the timber yielding plants in the form of this mahogany, which is a ship, uh, which is the timber used for the ship, and the only way for us to escape from the sea. And our ships are moving in the sea for month together, and we need uh, bad need. Uh, we are in bad need of this uh, ship building timber. So immediately, when this reason the Colonel Robert Kidd brought, immediately East India Company gave the nod for this uh, establishing this uh, E.J. Subhas Indian Botanic Garden, and in the name of Company Bagan. And Colonel Robert Kidd was uh, appointed as the honorary superintendent of Botanic Garden in 1787. He started this botanic garden, and he was the superintendent of this botanic garden up to year 1793. Six years he was uh, uh, the superintendency of this uh, honorary superintendent of this botanic garden. Of course, many of the economically important plants in the form of rubber, coffee, zincona, what not, even uh, the breadfruit, uh, this art, uh, this uh, artocarpus, uh, chaplasha, artocarpus lacucha. These uh, breadfruits are also were tried in this botanic garden. Many of the economically important plants in the form of rubber also were tried in this plant, and uh, they were completely spread all over the country. Whatever we are, we are seeing, all these plants has been tried in the uh, Indian botanic garden. Then only it has been completely taken as a platform for economically important plants. Colonel uh, Robert Kidd started this botanic garden. Later, the after Colonel Robert Kidd in 1793, the next person who took charge is none other than William Roxburgh, a very great scientist, a very great plant scientist, known as father of Indian botany, William Roxburgh. Of course, he was a surgeon in New Asia Company. He was taking interest in setting up some of the plants in Saharanpur, and he was uh, the way as the New Asia Company came to know that William Roxburgh is taking interest in conservation of plants. Immediately, he was appointed as uh, the superintendent of this botanical garden in the 1797, and for 21 years he was the Superintendent of this botanic garden, and he is the first solid superintendent of botanic garden. One important thing, what he did is, as soon as he took the charge, he completely changed the senior of this botanic garden and made it as an active center of botanical studies. And he described so many plants from the forest of India, and he even instrumentally in writing Flora India before the Flora of British India by uh, uh, our uh, Hooker, J.D. Hooker. 
the only book which has also which has available in india for with regard to the plants of india is flora india written by william rasbro only so very great contribution of uh, completely change the scenario of botanic garden what your botany now we are learning it is all the courtesy of william rasbro who made a very active center of uh, uh, this uh, active center at this ajc bus indian botanic garden and botany took a lead in the by the active by the contribution of william rasbro okay and this is the list of different um, uh, superintendents who have taken charge of this indian botanic garden kanna gabbard in 787 then william rasbro thomas sandy kolebrook and uh, here nathaniel valich contribution also very good and next one is uh, sir george king 1871 to 1897 sir george king who is the founder of botanic center of india and even he is got the knighthood as sir george king by the by the east india company because of the landscape what he has proposed in this botanical garden as uh, when he was the superintendent uh, <coughs> that's why east india company has given the not given the knighthood as sir george king and this is uh, list of uh, and up to 1955 uh, up to 1955 uh, up to 1937 the britishers were in charge of this botanical garden later indian people the indian scientists they took uh, charge of this botanical garden like this kitchen and i have got the privilege of uh, heading this botanical garden from 2017 to 2019 of course as a curator i was uh, present for, for nearly five and a half years uh, in this botanical garden then in 2017 to 2019 i served as head of this botanical garden this is the map of this indian botanic garden in the west coast of river hugli this botanic garden in 273 acres this botanic garden is running and this is the two important gates are there one is howrah gate this is uh, uh, here uh, this is the place where the howrah gate another is bicentry gate which is in the bakulkula area and uh, overall uh, 25 divisions has been marked and 24 artificial lakes can you see here the artificial lakes are present 24 artificial lakes and this type of network of artificial lakes and different areas was done by sir george king based on the landscape what sir george king contributed this botanical garden he was given the knighthood by by the east india company as sir george king so here is a <coughs> great banantry presence of the great banantry in this botanical garden and 15 is uh, 15 is uh, so uh, kid monument 9 is kid monument in the center of the botany garden there is a monument called kid which is raised in the commemoration and in the respect of uh, the founder uh, superintendent the colonel robert kid exactly in the center of the botany garden they have kept this uh, kid kid monument yes pardon 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 what happened you are required to find this sum up yes 10 minutes yeah. okay mm, yes uh, uh, then this is the this is the way how this sir george king has given the network of this botanical garden botanical garden a network of uh, artificial lakes and uh, for that work uh, uh, this um, uh, this colonel robert kid has been given the knighthood as uh, sir george king by the ishnia company and this is one very important attraction of botanic garden is presence of great banyan tree the senior most citizen of this botanical when the garden started in 1950 191787 this was uh, remaining as a small sapling now find of acres of the area is covered by this uh, this great banyan tree and which is a very very important uh, uh, iconic structure inside the botanical garden in 1925 the central stem has been removed and uh, in the place one monument is there it is of course a very important palm tree of some of the foreign delegates every year from the chinese uh, indonesia malaysia foreign delegates visit to have a look of this in the ages was this great banyan tree which is uh, of course the logo of botanic center of india is also uh, is uh, with regard to this great banyan tree and i told different sections are there in this botanic garden we are having uh, uh, this uh, charak udyan the medicinal plant section then palm house is there palmetum uh, inside the botanical garden nearly 110 species of palms are there in this botanic garden pinetum many of the pines are also present nearly 20 to 25 pines has been conserved in this botanic garden arboretum 14000 trees palms are there plant in 1500 species are conserved in this botanical garden there are cacti nearly 100 species of cacti and succulent has been conserved bamboo sitam 30 species of bamboos of our country uh, has been conserved in bamboo sitam and conservatories are there where many of the exotic plants bougainvillea section is there some uh, other uh, important areas are there in this botanical garden then different uh, monuments of this botanical garden has been shown this rajbar building where rajbar uh, completely described all the plants and this is a kid monument which is uh, raised in the memory of this uh, colonel robert kid and this is a curator building where many of the activities of this uh, uh botanic garden are being done in the form of biodiversity day environment day and this ozone day all these days are being conserved uh, are being celebrated uh, are being observed in this curator office 
and another important position is presence of giant water lily vitro amazonica the most the, the, the biggest aquatic plant of the world in the 1884 britishers has introduced this plant inside this botanic garden two species is there one is victoria cruziana and second is victoria amazonica victoria amazonica the the rim is little shorter whereas in victoria uh, cruziana the rim is a little bit uh, broader uh, a little bit elongated you can well say and this is the network it can very well hold the weight of some uh, Five to six years old uh, boy can very well uh, the, uh, it can hold the weight of this, the leaf can very well hold the giant water lily the uh, biggest aquatic plant of the world which has been turned out this botanic garden. Then we are having very important plant Rhodesia mellifera double coconut the biggest seed in the plant world. This is the seed which is present inside. If we remove the husk, this this will be the present. Of course, the work uh, so many things are associated with this. It is referred to as elixir of life. The water of this is uh, being uh, taken as elixir of life because it enhances the longevity of the plants. And this is the native of Seychelles Islands. And the rulers were keeping the water of this in their uh, rule for uh, uh, having the uh, increasing the longevity. And this is referred to as elixir of life. So double coconut, Lodacea maldavica, only one tree. The scientist of Banana Survey, Dr. Hamid's work, uh, Maiden Food Setting was done by this uh, scientist of BSI in this, uh, uh, the only one tree of our country. And then of course, a very other important plant has been conserved, which has been uh, introduced by Britishers. Branch palm, uh, this is Hyphenet tabaica, uh, introduced from West Indies. Then Canon Balti, Coropeta genesis of Lecithidaceae. Then we are having candle fruit tree, Permentera serifera. And then I told Amersha nobilis, the dancing doll, or the tree of heaven, uh, the avenue of this Amersha and Bougainvillea is there. And this is the wish tree known as Adensonia digitata. If you just touch our forehead and whatever the wish we just, uh, that will be fulfilled. Of course, the markings on this uh, tree is uh, the eyes of the uh, elephant and the foot uh, resembles the foot of the elephant. So these are some of the rare trees. Besides that, we are having the Rasgulla tree in the form of uh, this uh, Trisophilum kainito. Then we are having mat tree in the form of Terigota alata, variety irregularis. So many rare plants have been converted with this botanic garden. And uh, of course, uh, some of the many of the visitors, this is Harshwardhan, our uh, then Minister of Environment Forest is visiting Great Banyan Tree and just having many of the delegates, foreign delegates also, Seychelles Island ambassador is visiting our uh, our uh, <coughs> Saint, our secretary of MOE of CK Mishra has visited. So uh, many delegates will be visiting and we will be providing uh, some services also, uh, this uh, services to different uh, departments, even uh, National Biodiversity Authority also, they invite us for giving their background backup for the conservation of this biodiversity. 14 national meet, I happen to uh, attend 14 national meet at, uh, at uh, Chennai, NBA, NBA National Biodiversity Authority, and we conduct those on day, World Environment Day, all these are the activities and many of the IFS officers and ranger trainees also they visit and they have a glimpse of the conservation of this biodiversity in this botanic garden. And many of the different uh, act different programs are also being arranged and even uh, we are having very great earning also uh, from this conservation of this biodiversity in this botanical garden. And uh, in the 2016, the earning was 40 lakh 56,000 from the entry charges, boating and even the battery vehicle, divan vehicle, all these are the activities which are being uh, carried out in this botanic garden. And they, you, you can have a glimpse of this botanical garden activities, rallies are being conducted, competitions are being conducted for the children to centralize the mind with regard to the components of this biodiversity and conservation of this biodiversity. This drawing competition is being conducted and, uh, and uh, prizes are being distributed to school children. And uh, of course, some threats also will be there. Some of the associations will be formed, Morning Workers Association, they carry out rallies, and even they, some of the encroachments also they take place, come and cook the food, uh, all these things will also be there. You can have a look of this, some of these encroachments and some of the uh, threats which uh, they carry out. Some of the Morning Workers, they completely know, not knowing the importance of the important trees which are conserved and carry out some of the other type of activities inside this button. They sit and chat on the, in the Brownie Avenue, they are sitting and they are chatting. And here this lady is somersaulting with uh, some one of the uh, Lebron Bajori, one Mishni Pal uh, tree, a very important tree. They carry out uh, some of the untoward activities inside this conservation of these biodiversity parks. And uh, some of these field photographs I'm just showing here. Yes, these are this is the exploration studies carried out in Arunachal Desh, especially in the Sagali area. We we have carried out uh, exit to conservation and collection of orchids and uh, even uh, aromatic and plants, uh, aromatic and medicinal zero point also we have just carried out. And then the, this is the Sagali area. We just uh, remained as guests in the head of this Sagali area village uh, head and we, uh, we just uh, conducted many of the explorations in this Sagali area of this uh, Itanagar. And, uh, the, the, and the project was uh, collection, introduction, exit to conservation of rare and endemic orchids in which the, uh, the 
the the exploration studies are carried on gangtok in uh, in uh, tripura area shillong and arunachal pradesh area nokrek base is also was complete and some of the rare artifacts were this is esmeralda katkati then we are having this uh, dendrobium nobile epigena amplum silogen pistata then we are having uh, the, this is uh, the dendrobium jenkinsii dendrobium palpebre leon perax this is blue vanda vanda cerulea vanda stanginia many of the rare and endemic artifacts were collected and and conserved in architecture of the city in bakani garden and of course orchids also itself is a very big uh, topic to speak hours uh, are not enough to speak orchids are very very important plants uh, which are uh, loved uh, once as uh, botanical jewels as well as they are uh, regarded as aristocratic aristocratic plants in the plant kingdom and these are the some of the rare orchids which are being com completely documented and these are the this is dracula orchid then we are having epigena of them and they show biomimicry different shapes they will have here is the parrot orchid bulbophyllum rosaldianum this is butterfly orchid papnantha teris then we are having uh, termite orchid or white ant orchid anectotus elatior laughing orchid phalaenopsis parisi is there then we are having this dow orchid permanent uh, this is a dow orchid uh, is there here very beautiful dow it is there uh, of course just not getting the name tinoclum alvise this is renanthra uh, imshuti uh, this is not renanthra rincostelis uh, retusa the foxtail orchid then catonia pedenca is the bumblebee orchid orchis simia the 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 monkey orchid then uh, mouse tail orchid bruno uh, this is obrona bruno niana tinoclum alvise snake orchid and uh, this is peristeria this is the peristeria alata peristeria alata the 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 dow orchid then we are having uh, lady slipper orchids we are having lady five uh, totally indigenous six lady lady slipper orchids one is papillum spicerianum papillum insigni papillum villosum papillum hirsutigum papillum fairianum and only one uh, papillum lady slipper papillum duri found in agastamala hills is uh, these are the some of the papillum orchids has been conserved in our national aquarium at uh, yerkard This is Tania Bacon's duck orchid, then dancing doll orchid, Ancestrum goldianum, and eagle orchid, Stenophia wardii. As though the eagle lifting the from its beak and leg the Stenophia wardii. Then uh, how the orchids have been conserved? We have we are showing it here, and then many of the publications. Balbo from Palam G T was reported as new to the Sikkim Gangta ke Himalayan area, and uh, some of the publications. Survey and conservation of rare and endemic orchids in Journal of Orchid Society, Vanda Third Seed Distribution Center to Tamil Nadu. and uh, an inventory of our research scholar uh, dr suleiman has uh, published this paper i uh, have formulated this inventory of new orchids of kozhikode uh, area and then we take uh, even projects for conservation of aromatic and medicinal plants in the year 17 to 19 20 we took to uh, collect and document aromatic plants and to establish a new section of aromatic garden inside the asc bus indian botanical garden of course the then director is inaugurating this garden with uh, putting this pimenta dioica alspis plant in the center of this uh, uh, newly raised uh, area and these are the some of the plants which were collected uh, as the aromatic plants and they were initially acclimatized in greenhouse and then they were shifted to different plots and of course ethnobotany i told cultural diversity is also very very important and now it completely suffices for the study of complex sets of relationship of plants and animals to present in past human societies societies and the ethnobotanical study we carried out in andaman nicobar land because it is and it forms an emporia for this uh, ethnobotanical studies by, because of the presence of six aboriginal tribes i'll be showing in a preceding slide some of the uh, some of the activities of this uh, aboriginal tribes they how they are existing of course ethnobot the in 1895 hashberger is uh, regarded as the father of ethnobotany other scientists in the form of schulz robin robin sandel newmaster has uh, has completely elaborated the work of this ethnobotany at the international level in india the work was started by professor janak kamal the island lady of indian botany and the work was taken up by other uh, the next uh, preceding director sk jain the former director bsi has done a uh, marvelous work at the tremendous work in the field of ethnobotany and other scientists from bsa again r r rao and uh, dc pal also has contributed a lot for the field of ethnobotany the work of pushpangadan ndri the, the earlier director of ndri also is noteworthy with regard to the uh, ethnobotany of indian uh, indian tribes he the, his work on trichobus xylanicus is uh, completely uh, very internationally reputed work and uh, now this is the different field of ethnobotany i'm just showing and the, this is the trichobus xylanicus one plant completely changed the life of pani tribals of agastya mala hills and the work was accepted by for the equatorial award and the international and this is the work of dr pushmagadan and of course here is the uh, importance of ethnobotany advantage of ethnobotany i am a little bit fast now 
and uh, of course ethnobotany work is very very carrying out in all india corner research project ethnobotany he is finding more than 550 tribes of india are completely under study and these are some of the major tribes which i am just showing and uh, you see here uh, plants uh, data about 4798 has been already documented in the project all india corner research project on ethnobotany in which the major contribution is by bsi and other institutes the nbri cdri tbgri bbs one institute also they have involved in this uh, study of these tribals, uh, nearly 450 tribals are under study under this project. And coming to this uh, oceanic islands where uh, I have just uh, first posted and where I have carried out ethnobotanical work, of course, uh, Andaman Islands are very, very important islands. They are very important from different points of view, not only from plastic point of view, from uh, fishery, from trade and commerce, from naval research. Uh, these uh, yeah, islands are very important. From tourism point of also, they are very, very important. I'll be showing some of the slides of these tribals as well as this Andaman Islands. Of course, this is the distribution pattern of the Andaman Islands. Totally 349 islands are there, 325 islands of Andaman group and 24 islands of uh, Nicobar group are there. They are, uh, dif they are differentiated by a 10 degree channel of 60 kilometers, which is supposed to be the deepest area in Andaman Nicobar, uh, uh, the, the deepest area in Bay of Bengal. 1,200 kilometers away from the mainland, uh, these islands are present and running in this manner. And uh, of course, uh, not only the plants, even the animal side also, the uniqueness of the Andaman is very, very important. If you take mammals, we are having dugong in the dugong and whales in the waters of this uh, of this uh, water of this uh, waters of this Andaman Nicobar Island. Then we are having corals. Nearly 175 important corals are present in the seas of this Andaman Nicobar Island. Very beautiful corals you can see. Birds are also 264 important birds. This is a Nicobari fowl, which is not a thermometer bird. Then we are having uh, edible nest swiftlet, Andaman teal, Andaman pigeon. Very rare endemic, uh, then fishes are there, hornbills are there, very, very important, rare endemic birds are also present. And of course, from the, uh, from the independence point of view also, the Andaman is, uh, is very important because the presence of cellular jail, there many of our freedom fighters were being uh, completely put uh, to gallows and their bodies were thrown in Bay of Bengal. And uh, so medicinal plants of these Andaman Islands has been completely documented and uh, we have collected uh, about uh, 72 species of this plant has been collected and they have been uh, established in the, the Dhanikari Botanic Garden, a complete uh, different section of medicinal plant. And these are the different medicinal plants which has been documented in the Andaman Nicobar Islands which are being used by tribal uh, tribal population of this Andaman Nicobar Islands. And uh, many of the uh, publications, plant folk medicine of negative tribes, global importance of medicinal plants has been brought about. Of course, when you come to this uh, tribals, we are having two important uh, ethnic races in Andaman Nicobar Island. One is black race, which is involved, uh, which, which is coming under negritots, which are black, and they are having four important tribes. One is Great Andamanese, Hongis, Jarvas, and Sentinelis. When you come to Mongolites, we are having two important uh, uh, two uh, ethnic races. One is Shompens, and the second is Nicobar. They are white in color, negritots are black in color, and their uh, inhabitations in their uh, places. Of course, one tribe sentinel still is hostile. Even 2019 also, they killed one missionary who went to this their island for preaching Christianity. So that also is still, uh, still uh, there is hostility is present. In 2001 also, Jarvas are uh, having some of the uh, reports of Jarvas hostility has been reported. So now, of course, Jarvas has become very, very friendly. Great Andamani Sangis are dwindling type. Only hardly 100 individuals of Ongis and 34 individuals of uh, Great Andamani are present. And these are the way how they look like great Andamanis are there. Once 1,000 uh, members were there in Andaman Nicobar Island, now only 32 individuals. And state island of Andal, South Andaman, they have been uh, rehabilitated by this uh, uh, Andaman administration and tribal affairs. Mongis, then Sentinelis, far picture of uh, Sentinelis, Jarvas. Jarvas in South Andaman and uh, Middle Andaman area, these Jarvas are inhabiting. And uh, these are the instructions before going inside the, uh, the tribal area, instructions will be there. Drive carefully and only in convoy, solitary driving, risk your life. Photography is also not allowed. Of course, with the help of tribal effort directed, we could document many of the photography of the Sandaman Nicobar tribes. And this is the, in 2020 uh, Hindu paper, the Alan Jan Chow's killing has been reported and uh, still hostility is uh, there in this. Uh, and even cannibalism, if I have got time, I can well speak in detail on the tribals of this Andaman Nicobar Island, how this uh, ferocious, they, they, are, they have been referred to as the land of ferocious people, land of people with cannibalism, all these are the some of the reports which are existing with regard to, just I will take to five, 10 minutes or more. And then just, I, I'm just summarizing, I'm coming to the final stages. Yes. Uh, sorry, are to some. Just, just five minutes I will take. Then, okay, these are the some of the, these are the Mongolites. I told the Mongolites are white. 
Shompens and Nicobaris. Of course, Nicobaris more than 2.5 lakh population is there. They are now practicing agriculture and they are also in Andaman administration services. Great Nicobar Island, we are having Shompens. Again, 150 individuals only, very rare tribe having very much knowledge with that sounding plant. And some of the uh, Jarvas uh, works I'm showing and all the plants related to different aspects has been documented. And these are the, some of the photographs of these Jarva tribes, how they look like and what are their activities. And this is the baking of autocarpus chaplasha, what they de did and how they uh, make the, uh, their uh, ornamentation. They prepare girdles in the, when the uh, fruits are unripe. And once they get ripe, they get uh, sweet smell, they just pluck and just eat the, the flowers. So both ornamentation as well as the food habit. They are dancing with the uh, decoration of the Delini andamanica because as the Delini andamanica tree is in flowering, honey will be very much in the botanic garden. That is the indication. So with happily they are dancing. And this is a monitor lizard egg. And this is the Ashesha Fensile, very powerful bee repellent plant, what the Jarvas and Orofia Kachali calls a bee plant. Within five minutes, they completely make the bees to uh, fly away and they collect honey and they just uh, eat the honey. And these are the different uh, uh, slides of this uh, Jarvas. And these are uh, ornamentation, different types of ornamentation also they follow. They prepare uh, artificial hairs because, of course, they, are, they know very well that they're having uh, curly hairs. So just to mimic the uh, this one, modernized people, they use this artificial hairs prepared by the Licola petrata leaves. And this is the pseudo where a prinia leaves, uh, he has decorated his body both for the medicine as well as to relieve him from the fever as well as to body ache. The pseudo where prinia leaves has been completely used for decorating his body. And uh, all the plants has been, and their method of usage has also been documented. And these are the medicinal plants. This is uh, uh, Ardisha solanitia of the medicinacy used for mums and then Canarium euphilum uh, of the family Bursaresi used for uh, joint pains and uh, for fever Donax caniformis. Then for uh, this one injuries and for uh, burns, they use Nima andamanica, both Monistic andamanica and Nima andamanica of the family Monistic Casey. And uh, this is for Thotia tomentosa of this uh, family Aristotle Casey for fever and cough, they use this uh, uh, the liquid or uh, the, the solution of these leaves is uh, being consumed. All the plants have been documented and their mode of usage also has been documented. Of course, material culture also has been documented. They prepare indigenous uh, net and their uh, even conical, conical this one, uh, baskets and the honey tub they use to prepare their own indigenous mat they prepare by using the midrib of pandanus lirum, which is a very dominant uh, plant uh, existing in Andaman Nicobar Island. And they prepare this uh, chest guard for uh, hunting purpose by using the inner bark of Planchonia valida family Anonesi. They prepare this uh, inner bark. And these are the different uh, uh, material culture. This is preparing bow by using the wood of Orofia Kachalika, this one. And bows are, uh, arrows are prepared by Areca triandra. And even uh, the leaf of Orofia is also the, the stem of uh, Orofia also is used for these uh, arrows. And she is using the child carrying strap by inner bark of hibiscus tea leaf here that uh, they, they use like this. And uh, we, uh, we have just published this uh, this uh, Andaman Janjati uh, Jarva the books also. And many of our publications in Springer publications, because the work is related to indigenous tribes, Aboriginal tribes, the work has been accepted by uh, Springer. And uh, three uh, research publications has come up with regard to even Shompens also. We have documented all the work, how Shompens look like and their activities. And the complete the documentation of this has been done. And in 2017 as a major paper, 2007 as a major paper, current sense it was appeared. And in 2020, a uh, major paper on this uh, Schumpen, uh, ethnobotany of this Schumpen uh, has uh, again come in genetic resource and population is finger publication. And all the plants which are related to this one, they have been conserved and they have been uh, documented and all the information has been uh, uh, published in this journal. And all the, even uh, Nicobar is also complete uh, documentation has been done. Uh, what are about their activities and what are the constructions, uh, hard construction, all the plants, their usage, and uh, the preparation of some of the dishes using pandanus lirum. All this has been documented. And Makaranga nicobarica, a very, very uh, important medicinal plant, uh, which is used for processing of these pandanus uh, uh, kernels, is uh, being done, thinking that uh, they, they are wrapped the kernels and they boil it and then, then collect the starch and prepare, may, may make many preparations. And all the plants has been documented. This is Cavalus sericea of the family Goodinesi. The fruits and uh, the plant is used for poultice, for uh, especially bone fractures. And Nicobar is a very fond plant of uh, Nicobar is for bone, bone fracture, Cavalus sericea. And all the plants, again, tribal artifacts of Nicobar also has been published. How they prepare their uh, indigenous uh, dugout canos, 
all this uh, has been documented and all the material culture of nicobar is also has been documented of course now last uh, last uh, last but one slide coming to biodiversity conservation of birds leads to conservation of ecological niches and thereby preserve the food chain i told if there is no minimal balance the, the completely the ecosystem will collapse so that's why conservation of birds is a necessity rather than a passion conservation of biodiversity plays a vital role in regulation of chemistry of atmosphere and water supply so completely chemistry of water supply and atmosphere is completely regulated so complete agriculture is in the in the grip of this biodiversity so that's why we should be very very carefully from the biodiversity others otherwise the complete agricultural system also completely collapse so the, by, by conserving biodiversity the genetic diversity of plants and animals can be very well preserved and it even provides immediate benefits in the form of recreation and tourism many of the, uh, uh, the protected areas the tiger reserves can be very well visited national parks can be very well visited and recreation and tourism is there and lastly it serves as an insurance coverage policy for the future generation otherwise we will not have the animal to show for our future future generation only in the stories we have to tell so that's why it acts as an insurance coverage uh, the, the conservation of birds act as an insurance coverage for the future generation last slide coming to birds is an umbrella term which encompasses all the living entities characterized by itself it is an essence of life and it is document and its documentation conservation is the need of the hour india with its innumerable tribes and ethnic groups offers ample scope for ethnobotanical studies as well as uh, documentation of cultural diversity and now nicobar lands the hotspot of biodiversity with fragile ecosystem are very sensitive from conservation point of view these forest reserves contain germplasm many potentially important plants which are used for uh, by the different tribes uh, which can be put for newer uh, newer drug developer programs as well as uh, bioprospection can be brought about of course it has to be done by carrying out proper uh, mous to be signed with uh, some of the other department and uh, it can be bioprospection and uh, screening of uh, biological materials phytochemical analysis can be done and new drug development programs can be very well brought about of course here i wanted to tell CDRI scientists were completely when I was posted and announced in Kerala. CDRI scientists were coming. They were documenting work on Xylocarpus mollicans of uh, one uh, mangrove plant, which was very much effective for cerebral malaria. Like that work was going on, and so many of the potential plants which are used by this tribal uh, can be very helpful for newer drug development problems. And uh, biological screening can be done with uh, proper uh, uh, MOUs with other departments. the abuna tribes are under extinction due to various reasons like encroachment of forest and poaching and these are to be stopped and uh, this mother nature the uh, people of this mother nature are to be protected in their original habitat these sons of mother nature are to be protected in their natural habitat before they disappear completely with the restoration of indigenous knowledge and the complete the biodiversity of some of these uh, important islands especially lakshadweep islands and andamanikabal islands which are considered as the hot spots of this biodiversity they are to be completely documented and proper uh, record should be there and proper uh, utilization and uh, sustainable utilization of this uh, important uh, components of biodiversity can be very well brought about uh, thank you very much once again i thank to the uh, arunachal pradesh uh, science and technology uh, science and technology department as well as arunachal, arunachal pradesh science council for science and technology uh, and uh, dr rawat for giving him an opportunity to share my experiences field experiences to uh, before the august gathering of this uh, arunachal pradesh science and technology department as well as students thank you very much thank you so much sir for wonderful presentation sir uh, sarif sir oh. it was very nice and wonderful presentation sir you have given Thank on you. uh, conservation of biodiversity bsi perspective it, 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 it is my pleasure dr very it nice part of my duty it is part of my duty dr vinit uh, yes sir yes sir uh, matlab you have shown a nice slides and nice uh, uh, photographs of your uh, sir uh, life experience sir sir uh, you yes, have uh, served in different uh, regional centers and uh, this was your <laughs> nice Uh, my presentation sir thank you sir thank you or uh, we are very much thankful that you have uh, spared your time for this presentation sir thank you it is my it is my pleasure thank you sir thank you. any question from audience you may ask now और आगे जोर से बोल रहे गुड आफ्टरनून लिटिल लिटिल लाउडर फ्रेंड लिटिल फॉर लाउडर यस प्लीज व्हाट शुड बी द रोल ऑफ साइंटिस्ट लिटिल लाउडर साउंड इज वेरी लेस साउंड इज वेरी लेस 
sound is very less sir so my question is what should be the role of scientist and botanist in conserving uh, conserving the biodiversity yes same thing i showed now all these are the different activities of course documentation i told three positive mantras are there for this conservation of biodiversity one is documentation inventorization documentation and conservation these three positive mantras and for all these things scientists are very much involved without the knowledge i told there should be an army of uh, to expertise for uh, documenting this uh, important component biodiversity and all these works will be compiled of course i could have elaborated certain more things because the paucity of time i could not touch upon different aspects all these work will be compiled and the uh, finally the information will be coming to the director of bsi and it will be released in the form of documentation of, of this biodiversity for the benefit of different uh, other departments who are working on this uh, conservation studies of this biodiversity okay thank you okay welcome any question from online participants <coughs> <laughs> hello am i audible hello ah uh, yes you are audible please tell me uh, in your slide you show the uh, maldivian double coconut uh, lodosia maldivia yes yes maldivia uh, what is the current status of that plant uh, because uh, okay. as far i know that the one only one in the uh, far uh, house uh, at the howra so why we cannot take the uh, conservation approach in the lodosia maldivia It, yes that only has been done that only has been done in 1884 in 1884 britishers has introduced only one tree you see this is the this is the <coughs> very important tree of uh, seychelles island native of seychelles island and uh, about the background of this tree the life span of this tree lodosia maldiviga which is known as double coconut of course which is the biggest seed in plant world this is a native of seychelles island and yes. seychelles yes. islands people ha oh, wow. uh, pardon seychelles then, islands yes. people they know do not very well they never completely give the plant material even to get one sapling from seychelles island the ambassador visited and a meeting was conducted with the dr paranjit singh that the den director to uh, to just share one sapling they they, they completely conserve very important entities they will lose their record in the world record no, world level no so that's why very easily they never completely share their material of course sharing of the material cbd all this you know collection of the scheduled plants is completely banned even our many of the orchids in our country itself is completely banned to collect so how nicely whether very freely they give only one tree is there and our scientist with all difficulty they came to know this is the female plant here dioecious condition after 100 years only came to know that this is a female plant and we tried pollen grains from different countries and even from sri lanka peridine also the some of the trees came to know it was there and officially letters were released and pollen grains were obtained only the pollen grains obtained from thailand noon of the botanic garden they gave the so made in set uh, food tree in the uh, lodesia malika only one tree of this uh, uh, howra which is present there okay uh, yeah, we we can uh, culture for uh, by uh, protoplast culture pardon pardon but can we culture it to the protoplast culture or gram plasm culture photographs sir hello yeah of course npj nbi npg are people who are being approached in 2020 for carrying out some of the tissue culture multiplication of this tree of course in many of these palms tissue culture is again palm sign some of the poc members grasses they are very difficult to recreated plants with regard to tissue culture so and again getting material we are very much afraid uh, if we take the magistrates of this lodisha uh, malaga this tree also will get affected like that uh, very carefully we are just uh, uh, having an mo with nbpgr for uh, multiplication of this tree already efforts efforts has been taken up from indra botany i have worked only ah. one question from indra botany what is the current status of the north sentinel island we go pardon pardon Uh, what is the current status of the North Sentinel Island? Oh, Sentinel Island. Only Sentinel Island. Only Sentinel is are. It is uh, in the middle uh, middle Andaman area. Sentinel Island. Only that tribe. That tribe is now hostile. Nobody can verbalize. Uh, Alan Chow in the year 2019 he went there and he was killed by the poison arrows and his body also cannot be recorded by the Andaman administration. Huh? Uh, so the island is. Uh, 
ఉంటుంది <laughs> and then still that hostility is still there 2000 up to 2001 also jarwas are completely hostile but after 2001 onwards they have become friendly especially by the baktawar singh a retired colonel's efforts by which they have become friendly and much of that work can be documented of course in this tribe the most and foremost difficulty is language problem we have to take the help of some of the local guards which are there by this tribal affairs directorate and some of the police personnel who are continuously posted they have developed some contact with them and they are understanding their wordings of their language and uh, like that only you could document some of the information of these uh, tribals very very threats are there in this uh, areas thank you sir thank you very much uh, thank you so much sir thank you madam uh, moving on to the uh, agenda i would like to invite our next speaker professor b dayaraj palayam koti he will be deliver a talk on cytotaxonomy of pteridophytes i request dr b k rawar scientist e head of office bsi itanagar to give a detailed introduction of our next speaker thank you madam uh, sir uh, now i am going to uh, give the brief uh, introduction of professor udaraj sir Professor V. Udaraj is ex, uh, sir is an expert of pteridophytes. He has conducted ex extensive works on floristist ecology and cytological studies on several groups of pteridophytes. He has done PhD degree from Saint Javier College, Palayam, Kutty, Tamil Nadu. In addition to this, he has also worked on phytochemical studies of pteridophytes. till date he has published four books and more than 100 research papers uh, for his outstanding contribution to pteridophyte taxonomy he was awarded with gold medal award and lifetime achievement from indian fun society uh, he has also served as president of the indian fun society in 2021 he has made chromosome counts of more than 300 funds he had participated in more than 30 national and international symposium and uh, now i would like to also discuss here that he was support supposed to come here for conducting cytotaxonomy cal practicals and training but for some unavoidable circumstances he could not attend this program now he is joining virtually with us now i request you to uh, uh, sir to start this uh, presentation please sir thank you sir you are not audible kal aap aa jana ha bilkul sir sorry not audible now audible sir okay hello yes sir you are audible now hmm. powerpoint is ready yes sir it is visible visible everything okay may i yes, start sir. yes sir okay thank you dear friends my dear professors participants and ladies and gentlemen good afternoon first of all i thank the bsi itanagar and 
a science and technology department of science and technology arunachal pradesh for giving me this opportunity since it is a lunch time please be patient i shall briefly explain not too much i shall briefly explain the importance of cytology in terms of a taxonomy okay so the biosphere is with the lot of living organisms and we have to study by naming and classifying them identification and classification is the major task in studying taxonomy there are three facets in taxonomy classification identification nomenclature identification delimitation based on difference difference of first morphology that is morphotaxonomy the macromorphology micromorphology why the morphology characters are easily observable no need of sophisticated laboratory arrangements available well need terminology less time and effort needed so morphotaxonomy is the classical taxonomy at the beginning levels of organization of living organisms from cells tissue organ organ system organism but taxonomy in reverse order morphotaxonomy cytotaxonomy molecular taxonomy so based on morphology the classical <coughs> system of classification of pteridophytes by eb copland mainly based on morpho morphological characters just based on the position of sori shape of the sori etc with the advancement in microscopical and molecular technology the classification system changed day by day so basic taxonomy of bryophytes and pteridophytes are very important by applying <laughs> all the criteria whether molecular morphology or cytological characters cytotaxonomy is the branch of biology dealing with the relationships and the classification of organisms using comparative studies of chromosomes particularly the chromosome number and the chromosome behavior during meiosis so cytotaxonomy is the middle phase in plant taxonomy that is morphotaxonomy cytotaxonomy molecular taxonomy chromosomes were observed by nageli in 1842 chromosome research had already found a large variation in the number of chromosomes among plant species the determination of chromosome number is an important subject of that time chromosome number chromosome structure karyotype and behavior during meiosis these are important character in cytotaxonomy counting chromosomes plant scientists solve a century old mystery about reproduction that is geneticists have solved a century old mystery by discovering a remarkable mechanism that enables plants to count their own chromosomes their ability to detect imbalances in male and female contributions to the next generation determines their progeny viability and fertility they determine their own chromosomes in the gamete to avoid imbalance of chromosomes counting the chromosome is something that most animals plants and even single celled organisms need to know so problems of cytology and evolution of the, in the pteridophyta the book published by manton who is the pioneer worker in cytology of pteridophyta based on several studies it has been shown that the base number 29 30 35 36 40 41 or the majority of common base numbers in majority of the families in pteridophytes common base numbers cytological evolution in ferns based on cytology abraham et al they have uh, derived the phylogenetic tree, tree but this middle phase cytotaxonomy is not in complete stage 
with the unavailability of cytological data of numerous species from various geographical regions till today. So we have conducted <coughs> some workshop, psychology training, hands-on training workshop in Pune and in our college itself. So this map shows the Western Himalayas, temperate region, Western Himalayas and the tropical Western Ghats. These are the region in which the cytologically <coughs> most, most of the species have been cytologically worked out. Temperate Himalayas and tropical Western Ghats. In the meantime, Pachmari Hill, Central India, Vasudeva, Bir and Vasudeva, they have also surveyed the uh, cytology of pteridophytes from Pachmari Hills. But unfortunately, the richest region of Northeast India, um, they are cytologically poorly known region within India, but rich in pteridophytes. Only very few dozen species have been counted cytologically from this rich pteridophyte region. Cytotaxonomy of pteridophytes. Trends and the concept in film classification have changed from time to time. Prior to 1950, cytological aspects of ferns were practically unknown, and what was known was mainly due to the pioneering work of Manton, Manton 1950-54, Manton and Sledge 1954. As cytological information became more widely available, it began to be applied in classification. As more chromosome counts accumulated over the next decades, the position of certain species and wider affinities of genera, families, and higher ranks could be postulated. With the advances in microscopy, chromosome numbers provided a powerful new source of data for understanding the evolutionary relationships among ferns using approaches pioneered by I Manta. Some of the first attempts to develop hypotheses pertaining to phylogenetic relationships among genera incorporated cytological data in addition to morphology by Loyal, Smith, Pichisirmoli, et al. So, Mara, P and Mara, they have supplied the chromosome data. Mara have finalized the application of chromosome numbers and described phyletic lineages in terms of their cytological evolution. Which is a 1977 classification, which includes chromosome data along with the morphological criteria. So, we are proud to say the <coughs> Professor Bir and Verma, they have published the chromosome atlas of the Indian pteridophytes from 1951 till 2009. They have comprehensively given the cytological data of Indian pteridophytes by covering all the published literature. Chromosome count database is also available in the website. You can see and you can refer to any species. For example, <coughs> four chromosome counts in Asplenium decrescens, which is confined to South India and Sri Lanka, in which there are only four counts by ourselves. Five chromosome counts for another endemic fern, South Indian endemic fern, Pseudocyclosaurus octodus with the n equal to 35, all out by ourselves, our counts. Like Maratia fraxinia, which is a, a rare fern, the chromosome, there are four chromosome counts by ourselves and nine from Kerala. Three chromosome counts in Teris cabripus. So, new cytotoxonomic records on threatened fern species in Japan. So, with the importance of chromosome data, in several cytotaxonomical paper or cytotaxonomical paper, they refer and cite the chromosome number of their own species in each and every paper. For example, Peristratica, <coughs> in which they have cited better and here they are Chromosome number of microlpi of Ukariana from Japan. They have cited our reference. Monica Mudir Viraj, 1988, Cytology of Fans of the Western Gods. Taxonomic revision of the fern genus Osmolinsaya. Taxonomic revision. Revision of the fern genus Osmolinsaya, in which they have cited the chromosome number <coughs> data from our reference, Mera and Kanna. A yeah, revised family. 
level classification for you polypod ferns polypod a polypod yields in taxa they have cited the <coughs> chromosome number for stenoclina by giving our reference 37 base number Chromosome numbers of five species of Marietiaceae, Taiwan, with our reference. A new allotted triploid species of Osmunda. New allotted triploid species of Osmunda. In that paper, they have also referred some Indian citation. Was they want to bear Monica Mandir their age? So in such a way, chromosome data will be helpful for <coughs> ordinary taxonomy or classification, etc. There is theoretical data on already also. Taxonomic revision of the fern genus Osmolina already also. Thus, knowledge of fern cytology and chromosome base numbers has rapidly increased since the publication of I. Manton book Problems of Cytology and Evolution in the Trade of Eta in 1950. We routinely correlate chromosome counts with a flow cytometry analysis also. So, Cycus sersinalis, the largest chromosome in plants, largest chromosome in Cycus sersinalis, Stenoclina palustris, mitosis, mitosis from leaf tip, Stenoclina palustris. See the difference from size difference. So, let us discuss some examples of importance of cytology, cytological data in Indian pterodophytes as discussed in the checklist of Pteridophytes by Francis Jenkins et al. They have discussed it in a large number of species with cytological data, available cytological data. This is the Philippine Symposium, <coughs> um, uh, fourth symposium on Asian pteridology, in which my first student, Dr. Paul Raj, my, my own student, Dr. Benjamin, DSA Pune, and Dr. Ranil from Sri Lanka. We have attended successfully and after attending the symposium, Dr. Ranil had a training, psychological training under my guidance in our college. Now he is also a non-psychologist. After the symposium in the publication, Dr. Fraser Jenkins made a writing about the symposium in which he has mentioned Dr. Varaprasadam Girdayaraj working under Father Monikam. Dr. Irviraj being his long-standing and painstaking cytologist. So let us discuss some examples. When discussing <coughs> Trichomonas minutum, which is a large species complex, Professor Jenkins mentioned Trichomonas minutum as circumscribed here may itself consist of a cryptic cytological complex, which has not yet been elucidated further. Plants often show irregular meiosis as observed by Michael Mandel, 1988 89, though it is not yet clear if they are hybrid or upper mix due to irregular meiosis. We don't know whether it is due to hybridization or upper mix. Like that, Adianta philippans, it is also a large species complex with the several subspecies in which President mentioned that this is this is consistently small sized diploid sexual taxon with the basal angle of the lower pinnae, unlike with wider angles in the other subspecies. In South India, further diploid sexual plant has been investigated by Monikam Dirdiraj. There is Cabripus, not known from Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, or China, as reported by. Presses again, see in error for pseudo, uh, there is pseudo pellucida. This sexual diploid species, Walker 1962, Monicum and Erdiraj 1988, was also misreported by Ghost et al. in error of um, uh, there is pseudo pellucida. Telepteris is put along. This is another interesting species. This, uh, this species we have published as a um, uh, um, Trisla parasitica as diploid cytotype, but later on. Fraser Jenkins um, uh, described it as a subspecies of uh, Telepteris parasitica, subspecies Monicurudoron, a diploid taxon. Like that, Polystichum astropelisium species, a new species 
processing in this term new species by coating uh, the chromosome data. It was chromosome counted by Hirdayrajan Monikam uh, as tetraploid sexual species. Next, another interesting finding, our own finding, recent finding by my own uh, PhD student, lost PhD student from Meghamalai. There is confused or there is surgery. Fraser Jenkins consider there is confused or as a synonym under there is surgery. This uh, variegatedly, there is surgery. There is surgery is uh, deployed upper the mass. There is confused or is also uh, deployed upper the mass in South India. But recently, but here, there is congolensis. The triploid apogamous species, there is congolensis, has been kept as a separate species by Fraser Jenkins. But he has synonymized that there is confusion under there is surgery. But our finding from Megamalai, we have made a some thorough psychological cytotouch animal survey under there is confusion complex, there is quadrilateral complex in which we discovered. A new hybrid between Teres Argeria and Teres Gongarensis. Now the question is, if it is so, it should be also be a synonym. Teres Gongarensis may should also be a synonym under Teres Argeria. That is the question based on our new finding, new um, um, hybridization between Teres Argeria and Teres Gongarensis. So uh, several gatherings we have made uh, psychological studies. So that hybrid is with light variegation, light white band. We can see only under the transparent light. Otherwise, there is confused on non-variegated, there is surgery of variegated, typically variegated, there is congruences intermediate, the hybrid intermediate. Cytology of the rare and threatened sickle fern, recent publication by <coughs> my student, along with Dr. Benny Amin, it is in press. In it is a new cytotype. It is new to a cytotype for this species and the first count from Asia. Recently, we have, it is under publication. Like the cytology of an endemic fern, Lindsay of Malabarica from South India, published in Indian Fern Journal. This is the, <coughs> the, the sickle fern, Pellaya falcata. There are um, um, endangered fern. N equal to 58, 2 n equal to 116, tetraploid sexual. First count from Asia, new cytotype for this species. Thus, from these examples, you may understand the importance of chromosome data in the <coughs> classification and taxonomy of pteridophytes. So, based on successful <coughs> classification of system of pteridophytes by synthetic approach of morpho taxonomy. Cytotaxonomy and molecular taxonomy, the PPT system has been developed. But still, numerous pteridophytes are psychologically unknown from several countries, including Northeast India. In the meantime, molecular taxonomy overtakes the cytotaxonomy without the availability of, of enough chromosome data. How? Why? Molecular taxonomy. That is, gene sequence is just a mechanical machine derived data, but cytotaxonomy is still manual derived data by simple acetocarmine squash technique. So, manual derived cytotaxonomical data is more important than machine derived molecular taxonomical data. I encourage, request the youngsters to make cytotaxonomical studies on plants before doing molecular taxonomy in any group of plants. So, <clears throat> thank you for your patience at this lunch time. So, briefly, I have explained the importance of psychological data in pteridophytes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for wonderful Amazing. presentation Amazing. and sharing your valuable time <laughs> with us. Uh, any question from audience? You may ask now. Excuse me, sir. VDA is yes. Uh, VDA is VDA. VDA is there. VDA is not there, sir. Only thank oh, you. Yes, yes. Tell me. Uh, 
సార్ యాక్చువల్లీ ఐ జస్ట్ వాంట్ టు నో దాట్ వన్ థింగ్ రిగార్డింగ్ దాట్ సైకాలజీ ఆఫ్ నార్త్ ఈస్ట్ ఇండియా సో అస్ యూ మెన్షన్ దట్ మోస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద స్పీసీస్ ఆర్ ఫ్రమ్ సౌత్ ఇండియా అండ్ వెస్టర్న్ ఘాట్స్ Hmm. So what about that North East India sir? Are there any research over? No, no, no. Research, I mentioned nothing. Only from Panikrahi. Panikrahi have made some, um, around a dozen species of polypodies only. That is the only report. Nothing else. But he, uh, there is no work. No work. No work. Nothing. Nothing. I am ashamed to say. I am ashamed to say. So, oh. <laughs> with the presence of myself, uh, anyone can continue. uh what is your suggestions are to us that uh, how we can do that uh, psychology work on north east india because uh, oh you you see provide by you know body and lodging hmm? facilities i am ready to do at least uh, two or three weeks uh, psychological survey work in a good system if you provide me enough facility i am ready to do at least 50% species i may be able to try along with the symptoms sir you are ready to do but then uh, according to me what i am thinking that we need to train the young generation so that they will also do the work yes yes sir i have trained ranil from um, sri lanka i have trained another fellow um, uh, from tamil nadu um, uh, one of my friend student he has surveyed up kolli hills psychological survey of holy hills eastern gods he has done with my uh, training okay i have time thank you sir thank you erdara sir for your wonderful and nice presentation sir and it's a short time uh, 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 you have given that uh, your valuable time for us and uh, the students oh. and uh, surely we will make plan for this uh, psychological oh. training i am sir. ready i am ready uh, yes sir yes sir and, uh, training uh, we will That's take training from your experience yes. and uh, really we are very much thankful sir and because of your inspiration we uh, uh, now today's we are able to conduct this uh, webinar symposium yes. and uh, one month prior uh, we will inform you and uh, yes, dr beni sahab and uh, we will make plan for this cytological training uh, but training. this time some uh, conditions uh, problems and could not conduct uh, yes, yes, yes. no uh, so, uh, uh, one month before we will uh, dis, um, inform you sir. thank you sir before you have to finalize mm-hmm. okay sir okay sir uh, after finalization we will inform you sir yes yes welcome uh, thank ready. you sir thank you I'm for ready. your nice lecture sir very good. thank you once again i thank yeah sir there is one question from the participant yes, yes. hello sir good, good afternoon good afternoon uh, my name is yogi putam yes uh, sir, i would like to uh, I, i would like to know uh, the psychological evolution uh, differences in different parts of the country and what are the parameters uh, we have to take in consideration when it comes to uh, psychological evolution pardon what are the instruments uh, okay sir i'll i'll repeat the question huh. uh, sir i would like to know hmm. the psychological evolution differences in different part of the country and what are the parameters uh, we have to take in consideration when it comes to psychological evolution very good that is uh, i forgot to say eh? usually tropical regions are rich in polyploids when compared to temperate region our south indian western ghats are with more percentage of polyploid more than 62% or polyploid species when compared to temperate um, region himalayas western himalayas they are around only 50% or less than 50% are polyploids that is interesting find so we have to make a psychological survey throughout the region particularly northeast india if you cover you will get a good idea about the evolution of pteridophytes within india psychological evolution uh sir so why not experience i have experience by doing um, um, uh, fans psychology of fans of uh, both uh, himalayas and psychology of fans from western gods i have experience and our professor bir i had worked thank you sir okay welcome uh thank you so much sir once again um now thank you. okay cool. now we have a special song 
presented by Ranjan Singh, staff of Kendra Vidyalaya. Uh, can yeah we had colleagues nearly uh, before uh, after that we have lunch break for 40 minutes so i request ranjan singh come over the stage Is there a sir? You just minim close your that PPT, sir. Okay. I shall close my system. Um, Mr. Kayum, kindly unmute the innovation hub tree. Thank you so much for your beautiful song. Uh, now we have lunch break for 40 minutes. By 2.45, uh, you have to assemble in the room.
Okay. It's a request to all the uh, participants kindly assemble in the room. <clears throat> Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, all. We are going to start our second session of today's program. Uh, RT ma'am, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, ma'am. So, um, I would like to invite uh, <coughs> Dr. RT Garg, Scientist E, and Head of Office BSI Allahabad. He will be deliver. Uh, she will be deliver a talk on diversity distribution. Speciation in uh, mediculars in Pedicular. India. Pedicularis. Okay. Pedicularis in India. Uh, I request Dr. B.K. Rawat, Scientist E, uh, Head of Office BSI Itanagar, to give a uh, detailed introduction of RT Madam. Thanks, Madam. Thanks, uh, RT Madam. Uh, and uh, you are in uh, presentation, Madam. Thank you. And uh, now I'm going to present brief introduction about Madam. Dr. Arti Garg, Scientist C and Head of Office, Botanical Survey of India, Central Regional Center, Allahabad, has made immense contributions mm -hmm. in plant systematic and biodiversity. C has completed volume 19 of Flora of India for family, Scrofulariaceae, Lantibulariaceae, and Aurobanchaceae. Completed Flora of Chathisgarh, uh, Flora of Lakshadit Islands, Flora of uh, Sahid Chansekar Raja, Bird Century, and uh, Samaspur Ramsar site in UP, Bhoj Ramsar site and Pimbetka World Heritage site in, in Madhya Pradesh, and elaborated taxonomic documentation for various volumes of flora of India and flora of Bash Bengal. She has worked about 24 projects of which the pollen flora of family Thymeliaceae, reproductive biology of endangered uh, Eremoistechis superba, revisionary works on genus Barberis and Pedicularis including adaptation, evaluation, and speciation, and taxonomic documentation of families, Valerianaceae, Dispaceaceae, Sapotaceae, Styriaceae, for India are significant. Her findings on age determination uh, of uh, pristine trees of India have been highlighted by press and media. Dr. Garg has made several field surveys of Gangetic Plains, Ramsar site, and wetlands and from east to west Himalayas made remarkable discovery of Manmanhara plateau in South India. World 10th largest Manyan tree, Ficus bengalensis, oldest Manilkara hexandra, and uh, two oldest Adansonia digitata trees in UP, India, which gave, gave worldwide recognition to our country's floristic wealth. <clears throat> To her credit are the IAT, Mr. M. Sahu Award for Best Presentation, Science and Technology Certificate of Excellence 2017, Bowman Research Award 2020, and Outstanding Scientist Award 2021. Significantly, Dr. Garg has discovered 10 texts new to science, two new records for India, and one new record for Northern India, 36 new records for different states of India, and lectotypified about 65 taxonomic names, being an eminent phylogenologist with the BSIP collaboration, Dr. Dr. Garg has traced lineage of the genus 
Ludwig Yen discovered Bacilla carolinensis, the extinct species from fossil pilonomorph records. To her credit are six books, 12 book chapters, 156 research papers, with a total of 75 impact factor, as well as several abstract in conference and deliberation. Now I request you to madam, please uh, give a presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vineet. And thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my knowledge with the scientific fraternity. I, uh, I said my a very good afternoon to all the listeners, to the seniors, to colleagues, and to everybody. And today I will be sharing my knowledge, which is based on my personal research work for, for a period of about five years. It is the distribution, diversity, evolutionary trends, and speciation in the genus Pedicularis in India. So from here, I begin my work, uh, my presentation. The genus Pedicularis was first described by Linnaeus in 17, 1737, based on the uh, species Pedicularis sylvatica from his homeland in Sweden. Now the genus uh, char is characterized by a uh, two plus three arrangement of the corolla, where the upper two lips are uh, uh, joined to form a galea, a hood-like structure, which is the galea. And the lower uh, three lips may be free or variously joined. On the basis of this entire uh, configuration of the corolla, we uh, come to dis uh, species discriminations and through dissections, we come to authenticity of the species identifications. So in 1737, there were nine species and the number started growing uh, with, the, with the keen interest of researchers. It reached 14 species by 1753, but with the growth of time, some, and uh, there was some stagnation in particular species growth, but then it gained a speed. And at present, there are 678 species uh, in worldwide of which maximum species exist in China, 367, which accounts for 45% of the world species. India comes second in the number with 103 taxa among 81 species and 22 infraspecific categories. Bhutan has 67, 76 species and followed by Nepal with 63 species. So this graph shows the trend of increase in the number of species. Now, all the linen species, the 14 species which had grown in a period of two years, the, the, all the 14 species are still extinct. None of these have been either merged or they have been uh, synonymized or anything. Now, when talking of distribution, the maximum species, Indian species. So out of 81, we talk of 79 species are known to occur in the Himalayan regions from Western to Eastern Himalayas occupying uh, the entire belt, but two species are strictly confined to the Nilgiri Hills. During a course of investigations and addition of species number, etc., uh, it is evidence that most of the new species are coming from Western Him uh, from Himalayas, whether Eastern or Western. But Nilgiri has witnessed only two species to have sur survived through ages, and there is no growth in the number from the southern parts. So uh, when we talk of uh, distribute, sorry. When we talk of the uh, uh, distribution, there are 46 species in Eastern Himalaya, which are strictly in Eastern Himalayas. 24 species are strictly confined to Western Himalayas. Two, as I told, were in, are in South India. And 11 species are common to the uh, Eastern and Western regions, they are confined to the Central, Hima uh, Central uh, Himalayan zones. So uh, when these are uh, to be understood in terms of their ingression or migration, we have to compare it with the neighboring countries species commonness. During this process, it was found that 12 species in the Western Himalayan region, the species common to our more, more common to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the species which are common to Afghanistan and Pakistan are not common to the Eastern Himalayan species. And similarly, vice versa, we can keep on seeing that one species of Eastern Himalayas is common with the Myanmar species, the Nilgiri species is common with uh, uh, this uh, Sri Lanka, 
and 34 of the chinese species are common to the entire himalayan zones 42 nepalian species are also common to the indian species so this gives a fair idea of the ingression or migration routes perhaps from china and and these regions uh, species are coming and going to the entire himalayan zones from myanmar we are getting only species common to eastern and so on so this is a picture which is depicting the a migratory or ingression routes of the species in india from other countries in neighboring the pedicularis diversity depends on their uh, the color length of the corolla tube the galea and the labium structure and the uh, these together when they interact with each other we are able to find some species complexes the color ranges from white cream white yellow to crimson red and purple the tube length may be short tubed or up to 70 cm long as in pedicularis parotiti the galea and labium there are beakless and beaked type the labium may be spreading or they are found to be rolling up over the galea to conceal the reproductive parts and these range of variations have given rise to various species complexes in this genus with, and that's why the genus has caught much of the world's attention now when i will uh, be talking in my future uh, this uh, presentation all these characters will be uh, uh, reflected in terms of their evolutionary and their uh, speciation patterns so color range maximum species of uh, this genus are uh, found finding color range from pink to purple lesser numbers are known from uh, the yellow group Uh, these are some of the species i can keep naming them this is a uh, pedicularis uh, uh, husseini a new species recently discovered then pedicularis gracilis pedicularis longiflora this is pedicularis punctata half mystery and chilanthipolia then this is just giving a fair idea of what i have told just now that the different types of beak labium and the the rolling of corolla is found in this and the habitat is they they are very uh, short they are very small so uh, in field work this creates impediment because we sometimes tend to overlook them and pass through the species then besides the uh, macromorphological characters if we dissect out the flowers the filament characters are also very important in this genus because the filaments may be either all hairy in this number of species all glabrous they may be uh, here they may be uh, wait i'll have to see this yes all hairy all glabrous one part uh, of uh, these may either be hairy or glabrous means laterally they may have one lateral side covered with uh, uh, yes correct okay so this was a bit of confusion because of this okay all filaments hairy all filaments glabrous in so many species the anterior pair hairy and posterior glabrous is also found but there is a reverse condition is very scarce and that is just found in one species that is pedicularis nodosa now the species galea range is very important while studying the details because the species uh, there are species with beaked galea there are species with non beaked galea and then among all these various forms there is a, a large number of configuration in the form of their uh, occurrence in terms of percentage like leafy type the leaf types may be pinnatifid pinnatisect or some other type but the maximum concentration is of pinnatisect leaves uh, again i will tell this is in terms of some uh, adaptational significance because the pinnatisect leaves are quite cut and dissected types and because pedicularis are growing in very harsh climatic conditions these are the characters which help them to overcome the environmental stresses and the adversities of the climate so most of the species are surviving with their dissected types of leaves and the uh, flower color is uh, mostly in the range of pink the uh, the galea is mostly found in the galeate type of flowers the non galeate flowers are lesser in concentration and the stamen characters are uh, some, somehow equally distributed with a hairy glabrous anterior pair hairy but the posterior hair is very very scarce now talking of altitudinal range they occur from 1000 to above uh, 44 that is up to 500 meters 
in lower species in lower altitude species it is generally found that the flowers are of open type with a very spreading corolla and as we move up the elevate this altitudinal gradation the flower starts getting rolled inside to conceal the uh, reproductive characters from uh, parts from desiccation this we will see in later slides so these are the species which have got open type of flower in these species they generally grow in uh, in environmental conditions which are not very harsh and their open type of flowers can survive through those uh, diversity uh, uh, adversities but because as we start growing up, going up and in alpine conditions there is a lot of rainfall very high pressure of drops uh, falls on these uh, parts and there is a high wind velocity so to counteract all these we will see uh, that slowly this uh, galia starts elongating and rolling inside whereas uh, to cover that uh, uh, because all the reproductive parts are concealed within the galia so the labium starts rolling up to cover the galia for further uh, concealment for further uh, concealment from robbing of the pollen and nectar of the flower because the, these flowers are very specific in pollination also so these are the species with short beak ga galia the galia starts elongating slowly we will see these and here are the species which have got longer galia this is a higher altitude species the galia starts rolling inside and the labium starts spreading here and slowly it will start rolling up these are the species where the galia is getting slightly concealed the pedicularis uh, longi this is a reverse written this is pedicularis longi floria the galia has started rolling inside and in pedicularis elvisi uh, this uh, other other species uh, yeah pectinata the labium has also started supporting the concealment of reproductive parts uh, and it has started rolling as we move further this is a species with the longest beak type this is pedicularis elephantoid uh, elephantoides with all these we see the uh, the enormous amount of variations and diversities within the genus so with relatively encased galia this is pedicularis elvisii and hofmis dry here here we see that the species have relatively encased galia upward up curving of the labium as well as the corolla tube has started growing longer the longer corolla tube is to make a more pronounced attraction to the pollinator so that it is more evident the flower colors and the flowers are more properly displayed now at higher altitudes we have we find pedicularis megalantha where the reproductive parts are double concealed the galia has rolled inside and the labium has rolled over the galia so this is a sort of a double concealment and this is pedicularis bicornuta this is the culmination point of all the adaptations which is taking place within the genus so in a nutshell the adaptations proceed towards concealment of the reproductive organs from open type of flowers found in pedicularis punctata pedicularis gracilis etc to a complete uh, concealed reproductive organs of the flower where a ball shaped flower has evolved through various intermediate forms these intermediate forms may be having a longer uh, tube a longer galia a longer tube a long, an uh, up curving of the labium so why all these uh, adaptations are taking place these are basically oriented to for a successful reproduction because the plant is very specific in its pollinator they are pollinated by the bumblebees these are large bodied insect and during pollination they search for nectar and in doing so they collect pollen on their body parts so the a sort of a because of this specific pollinator adaptation of the species a sort of an isolation keeps taking place because other insects cannot cannot sit on these flowers and they cannot forage either for nectar or for pollen they are specific pollinator of pedicularis therefore is the bumblebees so these are the methods how they are collecting pollen and nectar and in doing so uh, they are collecting pollen in their pollen baskets which is transferred therefore from the anthers to the stigma so these are some of the species which is showing showing pollination and collection of pollens 
Now, because of this specific pollination uh, the, and addition to these are the microhabitat specific nature of pedicularis because pedicularis are hemiparasitic in nature. So they, uh, their root connections are uh, uh, made with their host plants which grow in vicinity. This vicinity and host plant uh, uh, hemiparasitic character with their host root parasitism, parasitism, a sort of a microhabitat specific nature is also developed. So now we see with the specificity in pollination, microhabitat specific nature, the species slowly starts becoming uh, isolated with the changes in the environmental uh, conditions because of which pollinator population gets inhibited as, as the specificity, specificity starts increasing, the pollinator population becomes a limiting factor for species pollination. I hope I'm making my point clear. So uh, again, I will repeat this part because in pedicularis, they are host parasites microhabitat specific with a change in the microhabitat, their species population starts falling. Coupled with this, because of the pollinator specific nature and a limited population of the pollinators in drastic environmental conditions, pollinator limitation also starts occurring. This leads to some isolation process which gets operated in the species, both in terms of external and in terms of internal conditions. Internal selection is in the form of compatible genes because when a species gets isolated, its pollinator starts limit, uh, pollinator limitation starts operating on the species as well as due to the microhabitat uh, change in character. Inter, they are unable to adapt themselves in the particular habitat. So selection starts taking place both internally as well as externally because the species starts getting subjected to environmental pressures. So the new individual in the process of speciation, we all know that due to isolation, when the isolation leads to a change in the genetic constitution, the phenotype of the species starts, of, uh, starts altering and when phenotype as well as genotypes get altered for a couple of genera for a successive time of period and generations, the species be becomes a new variant. So this is the process of speciation with photographs, I will explain this. Isolation mechanism starts operating as I told just now, be externally because of pollinator specificity and internally because of microhabitat and host porous parasite alterations. Such species start getting alienated from other species due to their gen genetic discontinuity because the pollinator limitation has set up. Res because of pollinator limitation and a change in their genetic constitution due to continuous inbreeding, this results in a restricted gene ex exchange. When there is a restricted gene exchange, the recessive genes also start expressing themselves. And because of the change in the genetic uh, constitution, the phenotypic characters start getting expressed and the species starts acquiring adaptations in terms of their morphological characters also to survive in the conditions, in the very drastic alpine conditions sometimes, they have to survive, they have to attract more number of pollinators and they have to counteract the drastic conditions of the climate. So in this process, some vicariation, vicariants starts arising. Such vicariants phenomenon have been witnessed in the field during my uh, tour to Sikkim. This was a species which remarkably had, this was actually, uh, this is particularly Megalantha, which is supposed to have had one galia, but then it was found to have acquired a double galiate condition. When a taxonomist see this, see, sees this type of change, it, at the spur of the moment, it is assumed that this could be a new species, but it's not so because pedicularis is a genus which is strictly having one galia and one set of labium. When there are two galias, we cannot say a double galiate species is a new species. 
it is a vicariant it has adapted itself it has given two given out two galia because the pollinators get uh, uh, landed on these galia to forage for the nectar and pollinator and in this process they collect pollen and transfer it to the stigma so this is a very remarkable example example of adaptation of the species other other places also it was found double galia has started evolving in this genus which is a, a, a matter of curiosity and needs a lot of investigation in the same in the same uh, population the same species there is a single galiot flower there is a double galiot flower this is a remarkable another remarkable example of the spe, uh, process of evolution and adaptation then there are uh, one or two more examples which photograph i don't have but i uh, in one of my field studies i also found another uh, species which was also having a double galia just one flower is having a double galia so this is just uh, an uh, you you can say exhibition of adaptations so from vicariant stage now this these alterations get conserved over generations there is a lack of species exchange because near they are uh, reproductive they are reproductively isolated populations and there is no genetic exchange between nearby or uh, allotropic species so such genetic exchanges when they get uh, conserved over generations over years between the different components uh, as a result uh, the two fold selective stages cross these uh, crossing these selective stages of internal and external selection a new individual arises which has got a quite a prominent phenotypic modification and variation from the pre existing species over generation when they become stable uh, a new species comes into the world of uh, botany and then it's a uh, really it's an amusement for the taxonomist so one new species this is a particularis ragwindi was discovered from uh, sikkim so to encapsulate i would say that uh, in particularis there is so much of diversity so much of specificity that the the population get tend to get isolated due to isolation of populations and internal and external barriers operating on these populations the divergence takes place divergence in terms of internal barriers because of continuous inbreeding the recessive genes the genetic computation uh, composition of the species get altered and this results in as well as external barriers in in terms of pollinators in terms of environmental conditions the species phenotype also gets expressed because of the changed genotypes and uh, and the new very vicariants formed in between they are all, they also get reproductive early isolated and over generations they develop a permanent set of characters which get adapted and evolve into a new species this is a uh, just a series of flower types which are showing you all the stages from open flower as it is progressing the length of the galia is increasing the labium is starting rolling up and it gets culminated into the species of particularis bicornuta so in my opinion from my field observations and uh, uh, my laboratory studies also i have come to a conclusion that particularis bifida growing at about 1500 meters altitude is the start is the a uh, primitive uh, structure of the corolla manifestation and particularis bicornuta at 5000 meter altitude is the culmination point and all in between forms at different uh, gra gradations of altitudes are exhibiting different types of evolutionary trends within the genus particularis these are just some of the field works that i have tried to show how we work in the field for this genus and some drastic conditions where they are found this is uh, in such pass area of western himalaya and that's all i would like to tell about this genus thank you all for your patience this week thank you so much madam for providing us a very detailed uh, overview of the genus pedicularis uh, and sharing your valuable time with us madam
thank now, you thank you also uh, now i would like to uh, ask all the participants if you have any question regarding the said topic you may ask now Any questions, please? Thank you, madam, for wonderful, excellent uh, presentation with the uh, beautiful slides. Thank you, uh, Thank you. for sharing, uh, giving uh, your valuable time for us. And uh, thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much, madam. Uh, with the last speaker, we come to very close to end of our sh today's session. So now I would like to of things would like to request uh, Moish uh, to deliver a vote of thanks. First of all, good evening, everyone. My name is Moish Susi. So on behalf of Ornachal Pradesh Science Center and also organizing team, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude towards all the eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Khanat Das, Dr. B.S. Kholia, Dr. M. U. Sarif, Professor B. Irudya Raj, and Dr. Arti Gar for taking out their time from their busy schedule and sharing their expertise views. Uh, and also I would like to thank all the participants who have joined online and offline. Thank you for your kind participation. And lastly, I would like to thank our host, Ms. Yaka, for her commendable job. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much, Moishisi, for wonderful uh, word of thanks. Uh, now, mm, yeah, uh, we you. conclude here, but uh, before I request all the participants to attend the tomorrow's program as well. We start uh, our program search at uh, 10 a.m., but due to the a technical problem we like we we take the time to start uh, today but tomorrow there will be no any uh, problem so uh, yeah so um, we conclude our online program here but for our offline candidates we have uh, we have a practical session right now so stay back Tomorrow, yeah, all the same. Nine forty five.